This is Dark Matter with your host, Art Bell. Now, here's Art. And so, another week of extra terrestrial radio begins. Good evening, everybody. I am Art Bell, and this is Dark Matter. A few, uh, few little housekeeping measures, I guess, to begin. About a million requests for a couple of uh, people, and I don't have immediate access to them. One is Mel Waters of Mel's Hole fame. Mel, if you're out there, would love to get an email or a phone call from you or contact my producer, and we'll do it again and get an update. Mel's Hole, well, it was about a man who found a hole in the ground that apparently was endless. Some pretty interesting properties. Also, John Teeter. If John is anywhere near the timeline, John, figure out a way to go to artbell.com, actually, either one of you, and uh, email my producer, Paul Bowman. He's the way to get on the air over here. And we'll see what we can do. So two oldies but goodies, John Teeter, Mel Waters. By the way, you know who I did talk to? <laughs> Madman Markham. I've got Madman's tentative phone number. All right. In the housekeeping category, inactivity. A lot of emails. I get lots of emails about, you know, what's going on with the show, Art? Geez, like 90 minutes and then it cuts me off and I've got to reconnect. All right. Well, there's a reason for it and a way around it. Number one. If you're listening to the program and you're cut off after 90 minutes, that means you didn't touch anything. So what I'm telling you to do is reach out and touch. Turn your volume up or down a little bit sometime during that 90-minute period. Then they begin counting again. You see, it's, it's, it's a sort of man versus machine thing. They know that man can make mistakes. <laughs> Not machines, right? In other words, you might tune into the channel and then forget for three days that you've got your computer uh, downloading and downloading and downloading, so they do that. And it will save you money and save them money because of streaming costs. You know, bandwidth is money. Have you heard that before? Bandwidth is money. So all you've got to do to prevent it anyway is reach over and touch the volume or something, uh, turn it up or down a hair. Uh, or almost anything you do on the receiver will reset that 90 minutes so you don't get cut off. Hope that helps. Now, the wormhole. The wormhole has been experiencing unusual gravitational effects. <laughs> what that means, translation, is that uh, our wormhole at artbell.com, which is supposed to reliably send a message over here, actually had some sort of software glitch in it. And, and of course, you guys pounded the holy you-know-what out of it. And that contributed to its demise, its premature demise. It crashed about 21 times during the last show that I did. So we now have a new, improved, cannot-be-crashed <laughs> wormhole. Heath Rowland went to work and wrote code and made a new wormhole, and it really is sweet. And uh, later on tonight, I'm sure we will test its metal by having you all send a bunch of messages. But I, I do have faith that this new uh, creation of Keith's, because he's very, very good at what he does, is going to hold up. Anyway, we're going to find out. Now... Um, BlackBerry. See the news today? 4.7 billion, something like that. People who have Blackberries love them. I know it's, I have an iPhone 5. It's hard to understand why people love them so much. They're businessmen mostly, but they love them. Now it's sold and they're going to cater to exactly those people, the business people. So, even though you heard the news today, if you're one of those guys, I know Bob Crane is, he, you'd have to rip his BlackBerry out of his cold, dead fingers. <laughs> so you'll be okay. And then it was really cute. I, I saw a kid on CNN earlier today, a three-year-old. And this, this is sort of an illustration of the times we live in now. A three-year-old. 
little boy, cute as heck. But mom and dad had just switched to iOS 7, the new operating system for Apple, and he was crying. I don't like it. I don't want it. Just crying, crying, crying. He doesn't like iOS 7. I'm just uh, getting used to it. I don't know how you all are doing out there. Looking around the world briefly, Kenyan security forces were in what they said were the final stages of flushing out Islamic extremist terrorists from the shopping mall where so many were killed. There are now, and this is really sad, there are reports that as many as three Americans may have been among those who attacked the mall. What? Americans? Really? Iran's new foreign minister is going to join talks with six key nations trying to rein in the Islamic Republic's nuclear program. That'll be later this week at the U.N. Good luck with that. Thirty large dolphins beached themselves in Brazil. We'll figure that one out someday. And um, another government shutdown. Seriously. Uh, It's one of the reasons that I honestly, Honest God, I, I really don't care very much. I mean, you can't avoid politics entirely. But if there's a reason to do it, it's this. Government shutdown. I, I almost feel like saying, who the hell cares? You know they'll come right up to the brink and then they'll either shut it down or refund it. You know, it's all about Obamacare, I guess. <sighs> Selective's DNA, high-velocity DNA tagging system, may come to a neighborhood near you soon. You can actually see it in action, I think, on the web. It's available in both pistol form and rifle form. It is a new tool that would allow government agencies to prevent criminals from running away or disappearing into a crowd before being arrested. Now, what this little baby does, it's a high-velocity tagging system. They shoot you with it, right, up to 30 or, say, 40 meters away. They hit you with selected DNA high-velocity pellet. It contains um, a unique DNA code to ensure the correct person is apprehended later. DNA pellets used by law enforcement officers tag individuals with the unique selected DNA code from a distance. Just wonderful. On contact with the target, the uniquely coded selected DNA solution leaves a synthetic DNA trace mark that will enable the relevant authorities to confirm or eliminate that person from their involvement. So in other words, if you're protesting something, and I guess you're getting out of control or whatever, they hit you with this, and boom, you're DNA tagged like that. Incredible. The times we live in, and I and I can still hear that that poor little three-year-old crying about iOS seven. I don't want it. In a moment, um, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to talk about Roswell, and we're going to talk about the Nevada Roswell. I'm Art Bell, and this is Dark Matter. Well, all right, um, this is Dark Matter, not some other show, so there's a couple of things I want to note here, and that is that it's kind of a different atmosphere. We have uh, either three or four hours, you know, virtually to do anything we want. It's... uh, it's amazing how much time we have. If you deduct the commercial time, which is extremely minimal, from the totality of the three or four hour show, you'll find out you're getting a lot of content. So it's uh, it's kind of like we can take our time and do things at a, a little or a bit of a leisurely pace. Something I want you to hear. And this is, as you know, well, I guess you know, or you may have heard, that uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. passed recently, a real loss. But I was able to dig up the voice of Jesse Marcel Sr., you know, the, the, the guy who actually was there 
at Roswell. And I thought you'd be interested in a couple of things that he had to say, and it's, it's certainly it's worth pondering as tonight we delve into what could be a Nevada Roswell or may have been a Nevada Roswell. Listen very carefully. This is uh, Jesse Marcel Sr. It's pretty interesting uh, Cover stuff. Up. It began in Roswell, New Mexico. Near White Sands and Alamogordo, Roswell was home base for many early tests of atom bombs and guided missiles. Here, also, the practice of military stonewalling may have been perpetrated. The case began when Roswell businessman Dan Wilmot witnessed an amazing object over the town. His son tells the story. This was their home in July of 1947, and it was one summer evening they were sitting out here. Dad looked up and the west and saw an object that came down and had lights blinking and it was rather frightening to him but he said all of a sudden it seemed to rock a little bit and sort of counterbalanced itself wiggle a little bit and then seemed to settle down and take off at a rapid rate of speed the next day reporters heard that the air force had found fragments of the mystery object crashed on a remote ranch northwest of roswell excitement ran high until officials announced it was only a weather balloon. Major Jesse Marcel, in charge of the operation, now tells a far different story. They took pictures, of course. They had a whole flock of microphones there. They wanted me to, to they wanted to some comments from me, but I wasn't at liberty to do that. So all I could do is keep my mouth shut. And General Raymond is the one who discussed or uh, told the, the, the newspapers, I mean the newsmen, what it was, and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, which we, both, we both knew differently. Major Marcel had to keep silent because of his strategic position at that time. He was in charge of all security and intelligence on atomic tests in the United States and the Pacific. Marcel retraced his secret recovery operation across the hot New Mexico desert. We left uh, Roswell perhaps around... 30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, as you can see, it's flat. It is very difficult. In fact, uh, with just verbal directions, that we know would have found it. We had to follow the rancher out there. The crash site was so remote, it took an entire day to drive there. The following morning, we went out to the site where the crash was. And uh, what I saw, I couldn't believe there was so much of it. It was scattered over such a vast area. So we proceeded to pick up as much of the debris as we could, loaded in the wagon. We filled that up. It took us a good part of the day to do that, because uh, there were such small fragments that we had to do a lot of picking. We found a piece of metal uh, about a, part, a foot and a half to two feet wide and about, about two or three feet long. It felt like you had nothing in your hands. It wasn't any thicker than the foil out of a pack of cigarettes. But the, the thing about that... She thought, got me is that you couldn't even bend it, you couldn't bend, bend it, even with a sledgehammer would bust over it. So I knew that I had never seen anything like that before, and as of, as of now, I don't know what it was. There is new evidence that the FBI then got into the case with a different cover story. Lawyer Peter Gersten, searching through declassified government documents, came across a mention of the Roswell case. One of those documents related to an incident in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, which indicated that the object which had crashed was an experimental kite. Uh, the FBI investigated the incident and determined that it was terrestrial, that it was from uh, an organization which had been doing research in, in experimental kites. What did crash in this desert? A UFO? A weather balloon? A radar reflecting kite? It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. All right. I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all the materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. It could not be. It, it could not have been. There you go. That's uh, Major Marcel himself. Interesting to be able to hear his words after all these years, huh? And then one uh, adjoining fact that's pretty interesting. The Roswell incident occurred on July 7th of 47. It was only three months later, by order of the National Security Act of 1947, that would be September 19th, 1947, the CIA was created. 
What a coincidence, huh? <laughs> All right, coming up now, Jeremy Meter. Jeremy is a Las Vegas, Nevada resident, so he's just over the hill here, who's been interested in the paranormal and ufology since uh, he was very young, so we can probably ask him about the paranormal, too. He's part of a group from southern Nevada called the Bigfoot's Pad Paranormal. What a name. He co-founded that in 2003. Jeremy has appeared on numerous media interviews and TV networks like Sci-Fi, His Greek Channel, International Channel, speaks frequently about ufology and the supernatural. In the last few years, Jeremy has been working on a case from northern Nevada involving lots of strange UFO activities. And here is uh, Jeremy Meter. Jeremy, hello. Yeah, how are you doing today, Art? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing good. Just got done eating dinner around here, actually. Okay. I, I didn't interrupt, I hope. Oh, no, you're good. I actually finished, like, <laughs> right before the show began. <laughs> okay. Are you on a cell phone? Yeah, right now I actually am. Okay. Uh, do you have a real phone? Um, not, no, just this one. Only that one. What happens if your battery goes dead, Jeremy? I'm actually plugged into the wall right now. <laughs> All right. I'm like right next to the computer if I thought. Uh, All right. Close well, we'll, we'll hope for the best. Um, I, it's hard to know where to begin because I hate to say this, and, you know, I appear ignorant, but I never heard of the Ely crash. Not very many people have, actually. Oh? Um, see, where to begin? Well, the Ely UFO crash is kind of a weird sort of event. That I actually, when I began researching it, I, I turned from one UFO crash to two UFO crashes and a UFO landing, I guess. People actually get the facts all mixed up, and they combine it into one big event. So you're going for a pretty interesting story here today, Art. I know most people find this very fascinating. The stories of men in black. I've actually encountered the men in black in person. Um, there's physical UFO samples that I was given, and I picked up from the crash site area. So there's... There's plenty uh, to right. talk about here. For those who don't know, uh, how big a town is Ely today? It's between 2,500 and 4,000, depending on who you talk to and who you ask exactly. And I think Wikipedia big... says 3,500, I think. 3,500. And uh, back at the time of the alleged crash, how big was um, it? I think it was, it was pretty much about the same. There's not really much going on there today because compared to back then, pretty much stayed exactly how it was for the most part. Isn't that so, not many towns do? That's very unusual. <laughs> so it's always been kind of a, just a little town. Yeah. They pretty much, there's three grocery stores, about a handful of gas stations. Um, I don't think there's any really big name brand department stores there. It's kind of, Kind of just picture small town America. The best way I could, uh, the best way I could compare it is think of the town on Stephen King, It's the Clown, to say that. But that's the that's what I compare it to. Okay. Um, any history of um, UFOs in that area, e either prior to or after this event? Um. Yes. Actually, the Ely area has been full of UFOs even before this happened. Oh. I guess. It was in 1844 or 1864, I was told. Supposedly a UFO had crashed into farmland out there back then, but I haven't really researched that specific incident that much. But um, there's also an area over, it's called Duck Creek. It's right over the mountain from Ely. It's probably about a 30-minute, 45-minute drive. There's been long since been stories of UFOs being reported back there. There's... There's an area, I guess there's only about 10 or 15 small farms out there. Well, apparently there's UFOs, or they call them strange lights. I just call them UFOs because I'll get into that in a few minutes. But lights, I guess they come out of the Duck Creek area where there's no inhabitants, and these, these glowing red and purple lights, they come through this canyon, and they actually they ride by these people's houses, and I guess they light the houses up whatever color these are glowing, and... They, I guess there's no sound. They glide, I, I guess, like six or ten feet off the ground, depending on the specific incident. And there's an area called Kalamazoo Road in specific 
before they're seen. And I haven't seen these lights myself, but I have plenty of stories involving these lights. And one of the UFO stories involving the actual crash comes from this general area. That's where the one of the UFOs came from. All right. But, well, you would you would acknowledge, I'm sure, this is not a really high-profile deal like Roswell was. In, in other words, not a lot of people know about it at, at any rate, right? Um, not at all. So then what in the world, how did you get interested in something that nobody's sort of ever heard of before? Funny story. Um, I was actually doing a another radio program back in 2008, and somebody had come on the lines and asked me a story. It was actually a ghost show I was doing. And somebody had called and asked if I'd heard about a UFO crash in northern Nevada, and I had never heard of it. So I went online and I searched it, and I found it. And basically the only thing you find online is the date and the location, which is Ely. And I, I got intrigued. I went down to UNLV, which is the big college down here for your listeners that are – I went to the microfilm collection down at UNLV, and the more I started researching, I was finding things that were very strange or didn't exactly add up. Like, the crash date didn't make any sense because I found basically nothing from the date that they had listed on the Internet. Well, I started getting really, really sneaky, and I actually found the original author who posted it in an old magazine called the New Atlantean Journal back in the... I think it was the 70s, 1974 or so. And they had actually directed me, the author of that magazine directed me towards the original researcher that had found it. And we got to talking, and uh, just based on his facts, I actually went to the town of Ely and found there are tons of first-hand witnesses, tons of stories, been to the crash sites and all that. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't really know, have any words to describe how weird the whole situation turned out to be. Um, with this uh, purported crash, uh, mm -hmm. is there is there actual? I mean, there's amazing stories to go with it. For example, they say there were 16 bodies. Is that correct? I know a pretty close number. I know of at least six or eight of them. Uh, there's probably more, but I, I only know about six uh, six or eight. So Do I actually um. Uh, do you know anything about those bodies? I mean, in other words, any details from anybody who saw? I mean, if there were bodies, then mm -hmm. I, I, somebody must have seen them unless the military got to the site. I'm probably jumping way ahead here and closed everything off so nobody could see. Uh, in other words, how does word come of bodies, whether it be six or 16? Well, our, this, is the, this is one of the most amazing parts of the story. I don't know if you want me to get, tell it all right now or not, but... There were stories of civilians. They actually found some of these aliens were living. They were they it's, they got away from the crash site and were wandering around the flatlands and right outside of town. Actually, people were reporting some of these aliens were alive, walking around. So there was some bodies, but some aliens had died at the crash site. Yes, but there was actually some reports of them actually I would just call it escaping, but they were escaped and were actually wandering right outside of town, probably about two or three miles from people's houses. Oh my God, they, these are people that actually reported to you that they saw these creatures? Um, I actually didn't have any reports of the alien bodies, and then told the Ely Daily Times newspaper had broke, they put me in the paper, and I told them basically a little bit of my story. And I got probably about between five and ten different callers who didn't know each other actually told me that they had seen either the dead bodies or the living bodies. They're not bodies, but living aliens. Did they describe them? Yes. This is another thing that I've never heard before besides maybe Flatwoods, the Flatwoods, West Virginia case of the same year. But anyways, um, I don't really know how to decide without giving a specific eyewitness story, and then I can get more into it. Um, okay. okay. I, I, any description would be very welcome. Well, I'm going to give you a story real quick, Art, and then I'll get more into the, the two different types of beings that they reported. Sure. Well, so the most the most detailed account of the alien bodies, there was four four children. Their ages, I think, four, six, eight, and ten. That's all two years apart. Two of them were one was a brother and one was a sister, and the other two were friends. This 
just like they're, they're friends. They lived at the base of a mountain right outside of town. I don't know if they want me to give away the exact name of the mountain right, right away because people are going to go out to the mountain to try to find something. I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Well, this mountain is literally overlooking the town of Ely. Okay. And people live on the base of this mountain. And there's a big, giant boulder in the center of the mountain. And I guess all the townspeople back then and nowadays, they go up to this boulder and they, I guess, hang out. Some people go up there and drink beer. Or people go up there and just the, teenagers hang out and that sort of thing. Well, these kids were up on this mountain. They were, their house at the base of the mountain. They were deep in this mountain and they were playing. I don't know what they were playing, but I guess they were just playing around. And I guess the, the sister, if I told three of them were girls and one was a boy. The boy is now deceased, but the sister was the original one that contacted me. I was talking to the sister, and she had told me that the girl been playing, her brother was tearing off. He took, he took off running very fast past them, didn't say, didn't, what, what, I guess he was like in the hysterics crying and running away, and they didn't know what he was running from. Mm-hmm. And the next thing I know, I guess the woman said that the other one of the other girls took off running and passed her from the same direction this boy had been from. And I guess she said that she had turned around toward this big boulder, and on the opposite side of this boulder, she said there was something it looked... She said that they called it Thumper the Rubber Man, is what they originally called it. And this was reported... I'm I'm sorry, again, please. They called it what? Thumper the Rubber Man. I don't know where that name came from, but (laughs) it was a robotic... a robotic-like creature, a robotic being, she said that it was either metallic-looking, and she said you could see the reflection of the rocks and the trees and this being's, I guess we could his torso, its whole body. She said that it had at least one of the arms was a pincher. I told her, like, Robbie the Robot, and she said, yeah, kind of like Robbie the Robot. But whatever mm-hmm. this thing was, she said it was either walking fast or it was running, but whatever this thing was, it chased all four of these kids off the mountain, and they ran into their house. Whatever this creature was was actually pacing around their house. And she said wow. that one of Now, is this thing large at all? She said that it was about the size of an average man, so about five to six feet tall. It wasn't... But with it wasn't, pinch, pincers. She said it had at least one pincher. I could have had it on both hands. I know that she said at least one hand. Okay. But whatever whatever the thing was, I guess they ran into the house, and one of the little girls actually fainted. She had to be brought to the hospital eventually, sometime throughout the day, because she was having problems breathing and was having heart problems because she got so scared at seeing this thing. Right. And apparently they called the police, and the police went out to the house, and they never found whatever the thing was. I guess they had went back into the forest. But here's where the story gets more interesting. It's so already interesting other... enough. Hold on a second. It's already interesting enough now. Yeah. Uh, you said the police became involved, right? Yeah, the police showed up on the property. So perhaps, with luck, there's some sort of police report that was filed? Well, I went down to the police station and tried to get police reports. They told me that supposedly they couldn't access the reports that were that old, which I think I don't know if they can or they can't. I know of other researchers that have found older reports than that, but... Yeah, a local police station, maybe not. That's an awful long time ago. Well, apparently... And, the, and, and, and so that we're... Hold on. So that we're clear, what is the exact date again of the crash, please? July 7th, 1952, which is five years to the date after Roswell. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Same same day of the year, huh? July 7th. Oh, yeah, five years later. Wow. All right, so no police report. Nevertheless, the police were there. One child ended up in the hospital. Um, this is a really uh, quite a story. It's quite a story. And how substantiated uh, do you feel, Jeremy, all this is? I think it's way underlooked, and I think the whole case in general should be talked about more, and more people should know about it than already than that do already personally. Well, based on what I've heard so far, I would agree with you, yes. It sounds like a big incident. When you have creatures, uh, when you have alleged aliens, people scared, mm-hmm. the police, hospital involved, uh, it's beginning to get to the point where I'm wondering. Now, 
I'm sorry to be jumping ahead on you, Jeremy, but I looked all this up on the Internet uh, before I had you on because I wanted to see what sort of story I was getting into. And I did find uh, a YouTube piece, which, by the way, I sent to Keith, and it's up on artbell.com if you want to see it right now. And, indeed, there's been a local investigation, and when they first looked in the newspaper archives suspiciously, the uh, the the day in question's newspaper was missing. All the rest of them were there, but the day in question was missing. Now they did go to, I guess, some microwave backup or something, and found a newspaper for that day, but it didn't reference any UFO crash. Am I am I right? Yes, because the actual date is in July, and the internet says that it's I think it's August 14th or August 12th. It's actually a month before that. So that's why the, uh, the past investigators that have tried to look it up have never found any information because uh-huh. they haven't been looking at the right date. They've been looking ahead of time. Oh, my. Okay. And the, uh, oh, sorry, Art. All right. Have you now gone back and looked at the correct date and looked for anything in the in the paper at all? Um. Yes, actually. The Nevada newspapers, especially Ely, didn't report any sort of incident if you go to Oregon, Idaho, Washington, or Utah, there it did make the front page of many newspapers in those states. Like the government or somebody censored the elite newspapers and all the ones in those little towns that are around there. Huh. Because Amazing. I don't know why a Nevada paper, especially the town of Ely, would not report that in their paper, but yet Ogden and Salt Lake City would have it in theirs. Because if it makes front page in Salt Lake City two or three hours away, I'm pretty sure that that would have been front page news in Ely, you would think. All right. Boy, I wish you had a real phone there. Um, it, it just, uh, cell phones kind of clip things off a little bit, and sometimes it's it's hard to hear. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you to uh, hold tight for a moment. We're going to take a very quick break. And uh, when we get back, we'll get further into the story. But it certainly is fascinating. I mean, imagine something of this magnitude, many bodies... And a crashed UFO in Ely, right here in Nevada, not far away from where I am now. Well, relatively. All of that, and we're just now talking about it after all these years. You're listening to Dark Matter. You know, this song, um, I guess I had never heard when I was in uh, Manila, the Philippines. I heard it on a radio station, and I I went, wow, I really like that. And, of course, I obtained it, and then pretty much listened to it until my ears bled. <laughs> That's the only way I can get a song out of my head, is to just do it and do it and do it and do it. So I see blood. Welcome back. My guest is Jeremy Meter. And he's talking about a UFO crash in Ely, Nevada, right here at home. And it's incredibly fascinating stuff. I mean, really good stuff. But that cell phone connection he's got is absolutely awful. Um, we're going to have to see what we can do to get through it. With regard to the uh, the wormhole, let's see. David says, the wormhole's a nice idea. But it says, do not expect a reply. I don't see how a reply is possible. It looks like a one-way street to me, in which case an expectation of a reply is erroneous. It should say replies are not possible. Well, wrong, David. (laughs) What do you think you just got? That's a reply, so the wormhole... I mean, feel free to test it, folks. Blast it a little bit. Send me messages. Send me questions for uh, Jeremy, and uh, we'll see if it holds up. I'm telling you, last week it collapsed like crazy. Now, Keith coded all weekend. I don't mean he, you know, lost his heartbeat or breathing or anything. He coded, wrote code, until we got a new wormhole. And so far, so good. All right, Jeremy, welcome back. Mm-hmm. Uh Now, question for you, Jeremy. Did my producer ask you if you had a landline phone? Um, yeah. Uh, and you answered what? Um, I actually have my cell phone at the moment. Uh, yeah, I understand that. When he asked you if you have a landline phone, what did you say? 
Um, I just said that because he asked me if I uh, had a neighbor or something, I could go use their phone. I said, no, I didn't. I see. Okay, well, um, it's it's really tough uh, on the air, Jeremy, um, because what you're saying is really fascinating stuff, and I'm going to try and uh, continue with you here, but uh, it's, you know, cell phones are just not the way to go for an interview. Um, that's that's why we talk about uh, landline phones. Um, so let's, let's keep going as we can. Anyway, um, the actual crash site itself, Jeremy, um, mm-hmm. you said it was overlooking the town of Ely, so obviously it's up on the hill, up on a mountain, whatever. Is there well, anything... not the actual crash site. That's where the where the living aliens are reported. Okay. The actual crash site's a little bit further away, like on a little bit further down. All right. Look, it's been a long time. I don't think there's a lot to fear from people going out there. Can you tell me where the crash site is specifically? The actual crash site is outside of the town of Ely. It's close to a town called McGill and another smaller town called Cherry Creek. And the alien beings, this is my theory, they probably came through the the mountains or the woods. Because the best way to describe this for you and your listeners is there's flatlands, and at the base, uh, these flatlands go all the way to the base of the mountain, and that's where the mountain starts. That's where the forest begins. Okay. And there are two crash sites. There's a southern one and a northern one. This is the southern one I'm talking about here. The southern crash site, these alien beings could have walked through the woods. It's not very far away. They could have walked onto this towards the mountain where they, uh, those kids seen it. Right. But. So All right. I, here, here's, here's, here's one for you, and I'm sorry. Uh, can you give me actual GPS coordinates? GPS coordinates? Um. Yeah. Yes. I might be able to. Let me look at my notes really quick. Okay. I would think uh, through a you know, long period of investigation, you might have marked the actual site with GPS coordinates. I, and I don't think there's any harm in giving it out uh, on this late date. I mean, it's been so long now, right, 1952. So people want to go and visit, and if people can find something, then, uh, hey, why not? It's okay. Sure. If, you, if, if you find them, let me know. It's not something I have to have right now. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying All to right. find the, the name of the mountain is called Squaw Peak. Squaw Peak. And I'm trying to find the name of the specific area where that boulder is. I know I have it written in right here. But um, yeah, I guess she, she said the locals just call it Big Rock. This is what my notes say. It's called Big Rock. It's halfway up on Squaw Peak. And that's actually where the crash site is. That's where they seen. That's where they have seen the aliens, the living alien creature I just told you about. Okay. All right. So that's not the actual crash site. No, that's I haven't gotten the actual crash site. Okay. Don't don't worry about it, uh, Jeremy. Go ahead and tell the story, and uh, maybe during breaks or whatever, if you can find GPS coordinates, I would love to give it to the audience. Um, you know, because some people might want to go out there and look around, and they might find something, Jeremy. You get enough people going through an area, you might turn something up. Well, I know that one of the girls still lives on the, the base of the mountain, still in the same house. So I was going to say, I don't know if she wants people to be out there. Because that's her actual backyard. She, the part of it is that they go down low enough. Okay. I get it. I wouldn't want it either. But, um. um oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was going to say, was, did you want me to talk a little bit about the, the general story before we get deep into specific parts of the I do, story? I do, yes. I do. Go ahead. All right. Well, here's a, I'll give you a generalization of the story, and then we'll get deeper into specific parts of it so as we go along. Um, well, around 1030 in the morning on July 7th, 1952, over Ogden, Utah, they had seen some kind of a weird, fiery object coming down at a, I guess he said it was a 180-degree angle coming towards the ground. Wow. It was struggling to stay in the air. This was reported as an orange fireball with leaving a blue gaseous looking cloud of smoke behind. And this object was originally reported in Idaho. I guess it flew over to Utah and then it went back towards Nevada. And Ely, Nevada is kind of in the northern the northern part of the state towards the top right corner. Right. Well at the same time at uh, around the same exact time there there were uh, civilian witnesses that reported a green T shaped object with a gaseous blue smoke trail behind it coming from the Washington and Oregon area. Wow. And these, these two objects are coming towards each other, and 
The next thing you know, this, uh, this, the, so the Western or Eastern object flies over Salt Lake City. Well, Hill Air Force Base, they actually had a tower there, and they reported that they had seen this object, and they, were, they actually got planes in the air to chase after this object, I guess, is what the Project Blue Book reports say. Oh, no. Uh, wow. Uh, this yep. is really full of uh, surprises, Jeremy. Yeah, Project Blue Book actually has about 10 or 15 pages on this, on this specific incident. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good to know. My, I had no idea it was uh, documented at all. And here you are coming with all this information. People having cited the descending objects. Wow. Well, here's what happened. So there was a B-17 that was flying around Hill Air Force Base doing maneuvers. I guess training of some sort. It doesn't really say, but this B-17 was doing training maneuvers, and the tower told them to go chase after this object. Well. They were going 300 miles per hour, and they said they came nowhere near this thing. They flew through that gaseous blue cloud I was telling you about, but they could never catch up to it. Well, people over in Montello, Nevada, which is in the top right corner, almost in Idaho and Utah, they reported a giant explosion as this thing had came down and actually smashed into the ground outside of the town of Montello. It's an area called the Dairy Valley. Okay. And nowadays, the, the small town that was in the Dairy Valley is gone. Montello is the closest town, and only 35 people live there nowadays. So if you plan on ever – I'll talk about the crash site a little bit, but that crash site's actually like a three-day drive, basically. And then I guess one of the objects had hit the other one, and one had came down south and was struggling to stay in the air, and it had crashed at the site that's near McGill and Cherry Creek, I was telling you, right by Ely. So this is where the story gets confusing. Is people people report that the two crash sites are actually one crash site, and there's something that happened in the 1970s in the town of Root, which is even closer to Ely than the Cherry Creek crash site. But that was the UFO landing. I'll get into that in a little bit. You know, that's not unusual. I mean, even with Roswell, you've got one crash site. No, wait, you've got two, and you've got bodies at another location. So, you know, what you're saying is uh, kind of consistent uh, with the way these things seem to be reported. Yeah. Well, something interesting I forgot to tell you was um, the Ogden newspaper from July 8, 1952, they actually reported that fire had burned 600 acres of land. Yeah, I think it was July 8th. Yeah, July 8th. They reported that this fire had burned 600 acres from the northern object. The southern object started a fire, but it wasn't as big. The fire in the southern object was reported at 1130 in the morning. And the northern one was reported around 10.30, 10.45. So they're pretty close between the amount of witnesses. Right. The one that had crashed up north was closer to town than the one that was in the south. And the one that was sighted in Utah, that was at about 10.30 in the morning, right? Yeah, the military from Hill Air Force Base actually reported that it was at 10.30 in the morning. Their time is when they had initially seen the thing on fire. Okay. Oh, um, we may have had so, our own Roswell here. Is that, is that, but, yeah, is that what you conclude? Uh, after all your investigation, do you conclude that what happened here in Nevada and Ely was, in fact, a, a, a Roswell for Nevada? Definitely. I have stories of alien bodies from the southern crash site, but the northern one, I don't have any stories of bodies up there. All right. But, now, all of this would have been absolutely impossible, it seems to me, to cover up, and according to, you know, the investigation you've done, it hasn't all been covered up, but at some point, and again, I hate to rush ahead, but was all this covered up? Did they come in and, I don't know, quarantine the area like there's been a plane crash or something? Well, I'll start with the northern crash site started. The northern crash site, actually volunteer firefighters from the town of Montello came up to the crash site, and I guess they had come up to this object. And while they were trying to put out this fire, because they didn't know what it was at first, they were trying to put out this fire, and the military told them to leave, and they quarantined off that area. Well, the southern, the southern crash site's a whole different story, because there's railroad tracks and a freeway, Highway 50, I think it is, mm -hmm. runs right by where the crash site is. So there were people driving by, and the railroad was driving by with their train cars. So quite a few people seen the southern, southern crash site. Highway 93, sorry, I just remember that, but... Yeah, quite a few people drove past that crash site. Um, <laughs> I guess the most interesting story I found came from a train worker. The Nevada Northern Railway is what the company was called. They used to run trains 
coming from Roots, Nevada, which has one of the biggest copper mine pits in the world. It's called the Robinson Mine. It's been open since the 1800s. But anyways, this train used to bring people to work, used to bring people to school because it was a remote area, especially at that time. And people relied heavily on this train. Well, um, I think I went to the Nevada Northern Railway Museum back in May, and they actually have records of every train log pretty much since the company started and when it ended. And the story I'm about to tell you actually found documentation of it at the Railway Museum, and I'll get to that in a minute. But okay. anyway, so this this man was riding on a train. I'm not exactly sure if he was an engineer or what he was doing on the train. I never asked him, but he was riding the rails, and he came across a section of the track. The man told me that was torn up like pretzels. The tracks were destroyed. They were thrown mm-hmm. all over the place. They're in the nearby creek, up in the mountains. He said they're everywhere. So Torn guess, up like the pretzels? Is that what you said? That's his exact word. He says they were bent like pretzels. Bent like pretzels. Wow. Yes. Uh, imagine what it would take to bend uh, the track, uh, a train track. Imagine what it would take. Oh, yeah. Well, so they managed to stop this train just in the nick of time, I guess. And I guess he said when they stopped the train, they didn't know what had happened to the rails. But I guess if they look off to your immediate left, up on the base of this mountain, they had seen where the this object, he didn't know what it was at this point in time, but the UFO had come from the sky, crashed into the ground, and skidded into the, the small brush and small trees at the base of the mountain. And he told me that the thing was still smoking. It had just happened. This was around noon, by the way. He said 12 or 12.30, so it had just happened recently. Right. And he said that, this object was out into the trees, and I guess whoever was in charge of the train told them to stay put, not to move. Well, some ranchers had come from that Duck Creek area with those ranchers I was telling you about, and they had gone out of their ranches, and they were all climbing on top of this UFO and picking up small pieces off the ground and whatnot. Really? This is, this is, this is, what, the, this is what the man told me, and this is exactly what so some of the locals stick to this story. They All right, well, here, here is, here, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, again, I'm going back to that uh, YouTube investigation thing. You know, they looked through Ely and talked to the, the population of Ely as best they could. They couldn't find anybody who could relate the kind of stories you're telling. I mean, my God, if you had climbed on top of a UFO, you, your son, your daughter, your wife, everybody connected with you would have heard that story because you'd be telling it like crazy, so it would be there for generations to come. Well, the, the thing the thing about the – because Ed Pierce is from KOLV News over in Reno was one of the back stories that you're talking right. about. Right. He actually has the 1970s and the, and the 1952 crashes or the UFO incidents combined into one. And the people he's talking to are, he's asking about something that happened over in Ruth, Nevada. And I guess the townspeople didn't know nothing about it. And there's a small town called Eureka, which is up in that area. My grandmother lives in Eureka, so you kind of have to get in with the community or know somebody to get information. All right. So it took right. me probably about three or four trips before they opened up to me and started telling me, because the first couple times I went up there, I was told there was no stories available, that no one had seen anything. But once I started telling them about my grandmother lived up there and I visit there all the time and right. um, showed them I, I was serious about the whole incident, they started opening up to me about all this. That's remarkable. And you have, remarkable. You have to go to all the small towns up there, too, to get information. So there were, okay, if there were people actually climbing on a UFO or what mm-hmm. was left of it after the crash, then there must have been some descriptions of... I don't know. It's its shape, its size, its texture, its uh, whatever. Well, about the people that seen the UFO, I only talked to one woman because most of the people they they have their lips sealed. They won't tell you anything about their name because I huh. guess the men in black and the military was there harassing people to get their names. So a few people that know their names, they will will not tell you. But anyway, so. Oh, this, this man said that there was about between five or ten people were climbing on this UFO, and I guess most of them were managed to get away before the military had got there. But I guess the object, he said it looked, it was silvery, but he said it looked liquidy, like it was wet. Like whatever the object was, he said it looked like it had water, like dripping off it or pouring off it. I don't know exactly what that is, or if it's just moisture from being in the atmosphere or whatever, but... He said that it looked liquidy, and it looked very smooth. He said you couldn't see a dent in it. You couldn't see windows. There was no sort of markings on it or anything. 
That's uh, an interesting way to describe it. You said smooth and liquidy? That's the exact term. He said it looked liquidy, almost as if it was wet or it had water pouring down the side of it. But but the guy also didn't oh. get out of the train to go walk up to it. But can't say I blame him. Mm-hmm. The woman told me the same, the similar description. She said that when you climbed on it, you would slip and slide, almost as if it was covered in a type of slime. But <sighs> so where this object had crashed, I'd like to tell you nowadays, there's no plant life or no nothing grows in this area where this thing had hit. All right. So that that the implication of that is you have been on that exact site, yes? Yes, I actually have a website I made recently, a couple days ago. I have pictures of me and my best friend in that here where there's nothing growing, actually. Crater? Yeah, it's like it's a crater. It's weird. If you look on, on uh, MapQuest, you could actually see it from the, from the sky. A crater, okay. Uh, now you're talking. These photographs that you took, do you have them? Yeah, um, I have I have them all on the uh, to my computer. I put some of them up on my website, but if you would like more, I can email them to you right now if you want. Uh, don't email them to me. Email them to Keith Rowland, webmaster at artbell dot com. All right, I'll I'll, I'll send those. All, all you've got all you've got to do all you've got to do is put webmaster at mm-hmm. artbell dot com. Okay. All right. We would obviously love to see the photographs. I didn't know you had these. Uh, that's going to be very helpful. I also have pictures of the physical evidence I was given, too. Oh, 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 oh do you now? And um, I have pictures of magnets, of magnets sticking to it. And I'd like to tell you, I brought these strange samples to several, uh, between five and seven geologists. Yes. And a lot of them worked at the mines up in the area, and none of them could tell me what these are. Okay, back up. You keep surprising me. Now you're saying you have physical samples. So you went up to this area, and how did you get your hands on physical samples of whatever we're talking about here? Well, originally I had gone to the town of Ruth because that's where I thought the original UFO crash had been from. Where, where, where was that? Right. I was given a rock. It looks almost, I don't know if you know what hematite is, but it looks similar to this rock called hematite. I'm holding this in my hand as I'm telling you. And this rock, it's dark, dark colored, almost like a dark brown or a black. Almost looks like a lava rock. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the color of a lava rock. It's smooth and it's magnetized. Like if you put a magnet near it, it'll stick to the magnet. Okay. I haven't, I don't try not to put it near electronics, so I don't want to ruin my electronics if I have it. But Smart move. Um, um, so this yeah. is, uh, you're characterizing it as a rock. Yes. Yeah, I was told that this is the stuff that was dripping off of the UFO. So oh. I they collect a sample of it, and it's hardened over time. Okay. So that's, what, that's what this is. You, you, you never saw it in any other condition other than hard, right? I have never seen it in any other condition other than hard, but I was given the same exact rock from the UFO landing site from the 1970s and, uh, and from the 1952 southern crash site, the same exact rock. Really? And so this was stuff that was dripping off the side of the craft that then hardened. And yes. um, to be specific, this was given to you by somebody up there? A local historian in the town of Ruth. A local historian. Uh, how did you discover uh, that it had magnetic qualities to it? The woman actually told me told me about it when she gave it to me. I guess she was playing around with it before she gave it to us. And this woman huh. had about five or six of these rocks. She just gave me one of them and the other one that we found on our own um, at the crash site. More and more interesting. Okay. Um, now, you did say a little while ago at one point, uh, before the military came, I believe is what you said, so the military did eventually get there, correct? Yes. Um, well, anyway, so the people are climbing around on this UFO. Yes. And I guess he said after about an hour or two, he said they were, they were sitting in this train. They had no idea what was going on, I guess, at this point in time. Well, he said that eventually several military vehicles, he didn't say exactly what kind of vehicle, but he said that military vehicles of some sort had driven up to the site and they were told, they told everybody to get off of the train. They were driving them back to Ely. But he didn't exactly really? say where they were going to take them in Ely. So he, they took them to Ely to the police station of all places. And he said they were interrogated by these, by these people. 
<laughs> well, he said they do not know what happened to the train. There's no records of the train ever arising in Ely or the town of McGill, which is the next big train station going north. <laughs> and wow. north of that, there's a town called Cobre, and it wasn't ever reported to be there either. So, anyways, I told you we had gone to the north of the, the Nevada Northern Railway Museum, which is right in the heart of Ely, and we were looking at the old reports from the, from the train conductors and from the engineers and all that. <laughs> well, we had found a... We had found a report that says that that a train had, was was going towards McGill, coming from Ely, and they said that this train, one box car was derailed, is what the this is what the report says. It does says nothing about a UFO, but it does say that 48 feet of track was was damaged, and the museum, I don't call him the curator or the head honcho at the museum, Sean Pitts, he was very surprised that this had happened. Because he told me he had never heard of any tracks being damaged in that sort of length or that he, I guess he, he, he's been there for years and years and he's never heard of anything similar to that. So anyways, the tracks come in 16 foot sections and that would be what, like three or four sections? Sure. Something like, so three or four sections of track were damaged. Bent like this. And, um, and it doesn't say what happened. It says, it has a, it's the same exact word. It says the people were taken off the train by an official. It doesn't say who. It just is an official. They were taken off the train and brought back to Ely. Well, it doesn't say where they were brought back to in Ely. They weren't brought back to the train station. And it doesn't say what happened to the train because in the arrival part of the log, it doesn't say where it arrived. It just says when it left. So... I wonder if they were taken back to Ely and put in a, some sort of auditorium-type atmosphere and instructed that they had just seen nothing. Well, the guy that was on the train didn't get into detail on what exactly they were questioning him about. He just told me that he was questioned because like, the guy started getting kind of scared when I started mentioning that I was going to be up there in a few weeks and I wanted to talk to him. So the guy uh -huh. got kind of scared. But Really? So anyways, we found documentation at the railroad museum basically saying word for word what this guy had told us on the phone related to the UFO crash. So... Anyways, I asked the curator at the museum how how because I I didn't know. I was I said how do you move a train? How do you move a train or what's the process? So he said that there's two ways. You can either take a giant crane from another train on the track and move it physically, like pick the whole thing up and move it. Right. The other way he said is that you have to take the train apart into several sections and then transport it that way. Well, so either, way, it, either, either way, it would have been a really big deal. Yeah. So the military ended up holding off that road I was telling you at the freeway that runs by there. And anyway, so they closed off this highway, and he said that they had, this was from one of the military men that was on the side. He told me they had brought the biggest crane in the county to uh, pick this thing up. So it's a pretty big, pretty big object. They got the biggest crane in the country to pick, or not the country, the county, and didn't exactly say what kind of crane it was or how big it was, but I'm assuming pretty big. I asked them the question about helicopters, if there was a helicopter involved. I guess the helicopters at that point in time weren't like they are nowadays. They weren't good enough to pick the object up and carry it like you could now. Right. But, so anyways, I guess they put it on a giant flatbed truck, and they drove it south. He didn't exactly say where to the south, but I know Area 51 to the south. I guess maybe they could have brought it there, but. That, that would be a logical, yeah, that certainly would be a logical place to take it. All right, hold, hold tight. My guest is Jeremy Meter, and he's got an awful lot of information about a crash that didn't happen. Except, of course, it sounds like it really did. This is the area of 51. Evening, everybody. Jeremy Meter is my guest. Now, what you're hearing about is very interesting because um, it really sounds, uh, for all the world, to me, just like a, a Roswell only here in Nevada and little known. But obviously, there is some serious amount of evidence to go along with this. And by the way, uh, on that note, uh, it's my understanding Jeremy is emailing a couple of segments of photographs to 
uh, my webmaster, uh, Keith Rowland, and we'll get them up for you. That may identify the location. Um, Jeremy, uh, you're back on the air again. Yeah, I'm sending you the pictures about two or three separate emails because they won't let me send them all at once for some reason. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, the emails, are, or the photographs, I should say, are going to be of this material, number one, right? Yes. And um, and number two, uh, of you standing at this, well, you called it a, um, a indentation in the ground, a crash site, actually, right? Yes, they're actually of the, I call it a crater. It looks like a, like a crater, like a hole in the side of the mountain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. And so the, the all... pictures also are there. Some of them are of the of a, I guess you could call it a base of some sort, a government base that was put in, that was made around the crash site. I'll get into that in a minute. A it's base made Congress. around the. Okay, go ahead. Well, it gets weirder. In 1955, <laughs> with 55, I think it was. Yes, yeah, three years later, the the government actually built a. You could call it. They built, it's called Project High Range. What it was supposedly was to track and monitor the X-15 rocket plane, which is a plane that can take off like a conventional airplane and land on a runway like a normal, a normal airplane could. Well, once Project, once the X-15 spy plane, they stopped doing that. They started using these bases to monitor UFOs and UFO tracking activities supposedly because I guess from workers that worked there in the 70s, they were saying that the government, what they saw in the military, was if a UFO had crashed here in the past, maybe they would come back in the future was their way of thinking at the time. Isn't that well, interesting? <laughs> well, I, um, I, I talked to I, Harry Drew and the Kingman UFO crash. He said that there was radar tracking towers built there. Um, that was, I believe, a couple years after this. Do you have any uh, idea why they would have it uh, set in their minds that if a UFO had crashed once, it would like uh, there'd be another? Well, I guess past they thought that if one UFO had been there, there had been another, or there would be another. They were thinking this because I guess in the past, I don't know if it was Roswell or something, they were getting heavy UFO activity in the area where another UFO had crashed in the past. I think mm-hmm. they were saying it came from, I think Kecksburg was what the guy was saying. But these radar towers, they built them on three mountains overlooking overlooking Ely. Um, Squaw Peak, ironically, is where the main station was put, where they were seeing those aliens on the mountain, and it's overlooking the crash site of the southern crash site. So I don't know if that's just a coincidence. I kind of think not. But okay. Anyway, uh, so- you, you, you've said that you have had run-ins with men in black while you were doing research on this uh, crash. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, well, uh, please, please elaborate. What has happened? Uh, you know, I love first-person stuff, so if something happened to you, I want to know about it. Oh, yeah, well, we had gone up to the, one of these sites, the one on Squaw Peak. You can go there now, but I guess it's not recommended that you go up there because they probably don't like that. And you're and they. They have the sign that says you could be shot for going up there and things like that. But I, I'll send you a picture of that sign, too. So when you get the emails, you'll see that. Well, so we went up on this mountain, and it says in the, in the 1978 our newspaper article on microfilm that they had demolished the base, but they had kept a couple of trailers up there on top of Squaw Peak. Well, if you go up there nowadays, there really there are a couple of trailers up there. There's a couple trailers. It used to be a big, giant radar dish, I guess. I don't exactly know how big it was. They're supposed to be one of the biggest ones in the state at the time. Well, they had this big big radar dish on top of there. You could see the sand is still there. I actually sent you pictures of the, the base on top of the mountain, too. Okay. Well, it says two of the emails went through, so you should have two of those right now. Okay. It'll take a, a few minutes for Keith to get them up there, but anyway... Uh, go ahead. You're going to tell us about Men in Black. Yeah, I will. So, anyway, so we went up to this base on top of this mountain, and there are a couple of trailers still up there with, with now with modern-day radar dishes on top of them. They're not huge things, but they're still there. And you can hear the hum of electronics coming from the trailers. Like, they still use it for something. I don't know what, but these were supposedly the trailers that these men were working in to track UFOs, the same exact one. You could tell the trailers are from the 1950s or 60s, 
judging by the, the style of the trailers. So I have some of those pictures of the trailers in the email I sent to you. Okay. So anyway, I guess somebody didn't like us going up there to that radar tower up on top of that mountain. Because let me start. Guys, so we've had run-ins with the government or men in black at least, I'd say, three different times. The first time, I'm going to get to the best one for last. The first time was when I first found out about the Hill Air Force Base being involved with the cleanup and the spotting of the UFO. I actually, uh, this wasn't a very smart thing to do, but I called the Hill Air Force Base and left them emails, and finally somebody called me. And he was a base historian. He actually called called our, I used to have a landline. They called our old landline, and I never gave him that number. So anyway, so he called our phone, and at the time, I'd like to mention, by the way, I'm in my mid-20s. At the time, I was only like, I don't know, like 20 or 21, whatever. So anyways, um, a man from Hill Air Force Base had called the house, and he was asking me questions about UFOs and things like that, besides common knowledge. Just out of the blue? So, yeah, out of the blue. The Hill Air Force Base called me, and the guy was asking me about Roswell and weird, I guess testing my knowledge on UFOs to see how, how well I was into it. He asked for my – I went to CSN, the College of Southern Nevada at the time. He asked me for all of my teachers' names for some reason and my student number. I don't know why. But anyway, so – then after uh, well, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, Jeremy. Um, mm-hmm. he, he represented himself to be who from where? He, I have my notes right here, actually. He said that he was some sort of a historian. He never gave me his name. He said he was the base historian at Hill Air Force Base. He told me that in the 1940s and 1950s, there were a supply and maintenance depot for Nellis Air Force Base and the other ones in the area. But, the Project Blue Book, Blue Book, sorry, again, tongue tied. They clearly said in Project Blue Book in black and white that Hill Air Force Base picked up the pieces of the UFO and that they were sent out, basically. Okay. Because it said that they had planes circling the area and things like that. Well, anyway, so this guy calls me, he's asking me questions. For some reason, he's asking me questions about my college and things I was doing in college. I don't know if that's trying to not make it sound weird to me at the time or not, but. So, anyways. He starts to ask me, okay, well, what specifically do you want to know about? And I actually uh, I actually got, I guess you call it, nerves of steel, and I asked him, okay, well, I'm doing a case involving a crash. He goes, what kind of crash? And I go, a strange one. And you can tell the guy, he, you can tell he was smiling on the other side of the line. He kind of chuckled, and he was like, well, kind of strange crashes. And I said, one that happened near Ely, Nevada in 1952. And the guy goes, those types of crashes are classified. But if you want to know about it, you can come down to the base, and we will talk to you about it. And knowing I'm a, I didn't go down to the base. I didn't want to know what was going to happen if I went down to the base, so whether they were going to do something or not. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I understand completely. I probably would not have gone either. Um, and then, and then they called my phone a couple more times, asking me more questions about airplane crashes and, and kind of more UFO questions. Really? And they never really said, they never told me why they were asking me this. I kind of just answered their questions because Nellis Air Force Base is right down the road, and I'd rather them not come to the house in person and ask me. <laughs> right. Um, um, so you, you would classify these people as men in black on the phone? Um, that was the military. The men in black story, the more interesting ones I'm getting, getting towards now. All right. Well, on the last time we went to Ely, which was back in May, me and my me and my best friend were we went this was one of the first times we went to the crash site. We had got these rocks and we were out cruising around. Well, we were actually filming filming videos that we were gonna put on a short documentary we we're planning on making. And on my best friend's camera, you could see that there's the blacked out vans are in the background with the people sitting and they didn't get out of the vans, but they showed up at several of our filming locations. And this is this area is very remote. It's like Ely is the biggest town for 200 miles in any direction. So, why? What are the chances they would follow us to small towns? And I'd like to tell you, most of these towns are like an hour or two apart. So, it's pretty long distance for these people to be showing up. That's that was concerning, but that's not the weirdest one. I guess it was back around 2011. Me and my best friend and my brother were actually going to get ready to take one of our trips to Ely. And we're going to interview a lady uh, that lived in Ely. 
I guess she had seen seen something like the craft being transported through town or something. Right. So anyways, the woman called me on a Thursday or a Friday. We were supposed to leave on a Saturday. And the woman said, oh, well, I'd like to thank, thank Jeremy and Nick, which is me, my best friend. I'd like to thank you guys for coming and doing an interview today. Your paranormal group is very professional, and she starts describing this interview. And I told her, I was like, oh, well, I, that's interesting and all, but we, we're, we didn't go up there. We're still in Las Vegas. And, and she swore up and down that me and my best friend came to her house. Well, she described it as two men in black suits got out of a blacked out van, and they knew all about, like, where I went to college, my friend Nick's life in Ohio before I moved to Las Vegas. And mm-hmm. I guess they're having small talk about our lives, and their facts were right on. I don't know who these people are, but she described them basically as your typical men in black impression, or like what you would think of the men in black. And I guess they conducted some sort of interview, and the lady got so scared when I said that it wasn't us that she never talked to us again. <laughs> so I have no idea what that was, but I guess nobody no, nobody else that we wanted to interview has had people like that show up. But we have talked to people that have been seen the men in black come to their house and threaten them within the last few years, too. Threaten? Yes. There was a man named Claude House. He's actually on that video that you have on your on your website. Right. Um, he was talking to the Channel 8 News in Reno. I think that video was from 07 or 06. He was telling his story about what he had seen or what he thinks he remembered. Well, I was told by a couple of the locals to go call him because I guess him and his brother was long young at the time, but they had seen something. I called him, I called Mr. House, and he told me, oh, I'll be glad to do an interview with you. And I said, okay, it's a paranormal interview is what I described it as. And he was like, okay, let's do the interview. So I called him on the phone to try to get, like, a pre-screening before I actually drove up to where he lives. And this man, he was like, okay, well, what do you want to ask me? And I told him, okay, well, we're going to be doing a story on uh, UFOs and this and that. And all of a sudden I told him, okay, well, tell me about the Ely UFO crash and what you know. This man, he did a 360. He went from calm, calm to hysterics. This man started blubbering and crying. I, I call it crying. It sounded like he was crying. He got very concerned. He told me, word for word, he said, they told me not to talk about it. They told me that I'm in danger if I tell you this. And he kept saying, they, they, they. I don't know who they is. But he said they came to his house and they are monitoring him in his phone calls, I guess. And he, he was pretty scared. Um, well, that sounds like uh, MIB. All right, so you said you're now in your mid-20s, right? Yeah. When did you begin investigating this? How long have you been at it? Um, Since about 07 or 08, so that's... A long time. Since I was about 18, 19? Yeah, that's so. a long time. So you've been at this a long time, and you've gained, the, kind of gained the trust of the people there. Yeah. Um. Hmm. I've talked to several people that had that, that seen that 1970s thing I was telling you about, and several of those people said that in the 1970s that the men in black were in town knocking on people's doors. Like, I guess they called them MPs. Some people have started as military police. Some people call them men in black. But I guess I guess he said that they had their handguns on their side. I, that's clearly what one of the women said. Okay. That they had handguns yeah. on their side, and they were going door to door in that town of Root. Were they in, uh, in the, Were they in uniform? Probably in peace, oh. sounds like. And I guess he said they were asking for information. I don't know if you want me to tell you the story of the 1970s thing here, if you want me to finish up on 1952 first. Well, let's finish with what we've got. All right, well, so the men in black were in, they're still interested in it, or the military still interested, because back, I guess as soon as the last five or six years, they were talking to some of the people that went on, went to the media or were online talking about it. I talked to Ed Pierce, the guy that made that video, the news anchor. He said he hadn't seen anything weird or had anybody come up to him. So I don't know if it's just certain people or whatnot. But somebody was impersonating me and my best friend. I don't know who. <laughs> and they were calling the military base. Hill Air Force Base was calling me and asking me questions. I don't know what that had to do with anything, but weird. All right, um, Pat, message here that says, the kid, that'd be you, 
is backing into the most interesting material. It's getting better. At first, I thought he was just reading Wikipedia. Now, it's like, oh, and I've got a physical sample of some unknown material. Wow. Yeah. So what have you done with this material? Have you had it well, tested? Um. I haven't brought it to a laboratory because they want a lot of money to, they want like thousands of dollars, I was told, by some of the geologists that work for, it's called the Robinson Mine, which is that big copper mine I was telling you about. Um, I guess they employ 500 employees in the Ely area, and most, a lot of them are geologists. We talked to three geologists from the mine. They yes. gave the same kind of testing they do on the rocks at the mine. They were scratching it with knives, looking at the color, holding up the different types of charts and things. They said that it's the closest thing that it's related to is hematite, but I guess they said that it's not exactly like hematite, but that's what it's similar to. That's one rock sample. The other one that I don't have in my in my possession is shown twice. Well, this sample, it was yellow, almost like a, a bumblebee color, like when you picture a bumblebee, like yellow. It was light yellow color, but it was hollow in the center. I felt like it was hollow or like a honeycomb type type of texture. And if you tapped it on a desk, you could you could feel that that it wasn't so it was hollow. Well, the townspeople, the two people that showed us the samples wouldn't tell us where they got this from. But we also talked to um those geologists and showed them pictures of this sample. And I also sent you pictures of it too, but nobody could tell us exactly what that is. We talked to a man that worked at the smelters in the town of McGill, which is near the next town up from Ely going north, and he said that he dealt with sulfur for years and years working at the smelters, and he said that he didn't think that it was sulfur. So I don't know what that sample is. But I was Well, uh, generally, uh, Jeremy, I've found that if you have a sample of something that is really anomalous, I can guarantee you, uh, that somebody will come along, Linda Moulton Howe or somebody at that level uh, who is interested in real science, and if they find that it's anomalous, they will get it to the right labs, I can promise you. Hmm. I know. Um, I think they wanted like $3,000 or something like that to look at a similar sample from the Kingman UFO crash. I know he said he paid for that out of pocket. So after hearing that, I didn't even... Oh, it's, it, it, listen, make no, no mistake, Jeremy, it's going to cost money to get it tested. What I'm saying, though, is if what you have is really anomalous, trust me, uh, the people who count will find a way to get the money to get it done. No problem. Yeah. Are you are you willing to allow the sample to be tested? Um, yeah, I'm willing to get it tested. I just don't know if I want to give away the whole sample. I'll give like half of it or something. That would be fine. I, kind of, I want uh, at least a piece of it to keep for myself. That'd be fine. I, I received similar material, Jeremy, and I did exactly that. I kind of pieced it out for testing. And uh, you'll hear a future show we'll do with Linda Moulton Howe that will give you some of the results from that testing. At any rate, let me assure you, as we go into a break, that it can be tested. That the right people will come along and test it for you. Ain't got no trouble in my Good evening. My guest is Jeremy Meter uh, from Las Vegas, and he has been investigating a alleged uh, crash in Ely, Nevada, back in uh, 1952, July 7th of 1952. Now, thus far, we're talking about witnesses who have seen what? Aliens with pincers? There were uh, possibly as many as 16 bodies? He has had a men in black sort of experience on the phone, I would say, more than uh, in person. He has interviewed people who actually saw other people. And, I, I, you know, some of this is pretty important eyewitness stuff, actually crawling on a UFO. Crawling on a UFO. It destroyed some train tracks, turned them into virtual pretzels, he said. Um, it's, it's coming out in sort of starts and stops and spurts, the story, that is. But when you consider the totality of the story, and you consider that there's actual physical evidence to be examined, as well as a crash site, it adds up to quite a story. Now, it is coming out sort of in somewhat disjointed pieces, and some of that may be my fault for asking early questions, uh, or questions that should be asked later, early, however you want to look at it, I don't know. Jeremy, uh, welcome back. Now, 
it, the whole the totality of your story is significant, and it seems to me that it's so significant that MUFON or some other very large organization should move in based on just what you've found and the witnesses you've talked to and conduct a, a real downtown investigation. What do you think? Um, I actually contacted MUFON, and they weren't interested. I, I already sent them four <laughs> or five emails talking about my material. and Really? Uh, they haven't showed any interest. Did they, say, did they say why? Um, I just don't, I don't really know. I don't know if they don't believe me or what. I know I talk to Stanton Friedman and Jamal. I talk to him all the time about it. He, fi- he finds it really interesting, I guess. I don't know. I'm not exactly, I don't recall what the chapter, the Nevada chapter's leader, what his name is, but I right. sent him a couple of emails. There's like a secondary email on their website. I wrote them and they never really replied back. So I don't know. It seems like they're not very interested, or I don't know exactly what's going on. Has anybody, I mean, in a real investigation, for example, uh, Jeremy, um, you would bring an artist or some sort of artist uh, to a witness, and you would say, look, what did this creature look like? And you would attempt to do an artist drawing. You, you would do, you know, the normal stuff that investigators do. Um, ha- has there been any representation to you like that? Uh, anybody who's drawn what they saw? Nobody's drawn anything. Nobody. I, every time I usually ask if I could have them draw a sketch or if I could have them talk on camera, most of the time, I don't have any sketches, by the way, but most of the time they're afraid that somebody's going to contact them. or I don't know. Most of the time they, they don't want to be have their story out to the public a lot of the time. Okay. Yeah, I, I do understand that. People are very reluctant to talk about this kind of thing, and for probably pretty good reason. But, uh, gosh, it it, it just begs to have more investigation. Uh, I guess you haven't, you've been doggedly pursuing it, right? Oh, yeah. I I pretty much eat, sleep, and breathe beauty for the most part. Mm. Um, Yes. Um, What else was I going to say? I found the story to be really interesting. I, I, I'm kind of surprised that nobody else has really found anything, found anything like nearly what I found. I, I don't know, I don't know exactly you know, why else very many people haven't tried to find it or if they just looked for that one specific time frame in August or what the deal is. Uh, one, uh, you said in August? Well, they said it was August on the internet, but it was actually, it happened in July. It was the 1952 incident. I don't right. know if they were all looking in August, and that's why they kind of gave up if it wasn't in August or what the deal was. Well, 1952 is a long time ago in one way and not very long in, in another way. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, if people have seen creatures, people have seen, have been climbing on a UFO, these are things that would be passed down uh, through generations. And there'd be a story, let me just sit on my knee here, and I'm going to tell you when, about the time I climbed on a UFO, that kind of thing. So those stories really are going to be around. Now, you've heard some of them, but holy mackerel, this is a pretty big deal. And, Jeremy, did the uh, the military, when they did come in, did they cordon off the area? What did they do? Uh, you told me about the train. What about the yeah. craft itself and so forth? Well, I know they picked up the craft with a giant crane, and they hauled out the craft. He said that I guess they weren't allowed to go back to work on the railroad for a, I don't know how long. He didn't really say. He said they weren't allowed to go back to work for a while. Mm-hmm. So I guess they stopped the trains going through. Claude House, the, the man that got scared when we asked him about UFOs, right. and his story that he actually told Ed Pierce of the Reno News, he said that the actual freeway was cordoned off. So from from judging by that, I I never heard anybody else say that the freeway was cordoned off. I don't I, I don't see why it wouldn't be, but um, I guess apparently they kept the, the people out of the area at least at least on the railroad. And for, judging by Claude's story, apparently they closed down the highway too. <laughs> okay. Because he um, said that uh, many people say that they were told that a small plane had crashed in the area. Is what is what they were telling everybody. That would be the usual story, sure. So huh. I don't exactly know how long they kept that story up, but like I said, it wasn't reported in the newspapers, so I don't exactly know how they were getting that message out at the same time. 
Okay. Um, have you pretty much stuck with the Ely crash, or have you been uh, involved in ufology otherwise? Well, funny story, really. There's a place called Mount Potosi. It's right outside Las Vegas. It's in between Pahrump and Las Vegas. I guess it's called Potosi. I can Pass. walk out of my studio and look at Potosi if the sun was up. Oh, well. Mount Potosi has, I guess there's a lot of UFO stories coming from Mount Potosi. I actually had a weird experience. What got me involved in ufology was when I was about 11 years old, I was in Scouts. And we went on this night hike in Mount Potosi because there's a Boy Scout camp up there. It's close to the public. But we were on this night hike in the woods. And we went around this corner. And on this straightaway, I guess off to our left, ironically, like, off to our left, there was some kind of an object that was sitting sitting on the ground. It looked like the end of a boat, like a point, but it was coming off of an egg-shaped craft. It was sitting on three stilt-looking legs. Right. And uh, me, my mom, and three other scouts and their moms actually just walked past this craft. I didn't think nothing of it at the time until the next morning when we came back and the thing was gone. You could see three indentations in the ground where the thing was sitting. I firmly believe that it was a UFO. I mean, you, you could argue that it wasn't, but I think that it was personally. And that's what got me interested in ufology. All right. Well, anyway, with regard to the crash uh, in Ely, mm -hmm. coming back to that for a second, uh, we've covered uh, where it happened, when it happened. Uh, of course, we, we I guess we can't know what became of the creatures. We can't know what became of the craft itself. Well, I can tell you a little bit about what happened to the creatures. All right. Please do. All right. Well, Searching, searching through the archives and the old newspapers, we came across on July 10th, I think it was the, the Oregon newspaper or the Elko, Nevada newspaper, one of the two. It says that, this is just a casual article, mind you, out of the middle of nowhere, they say, oh, well, the aliens that were brought to the Healy police station were shaped chimps. No need to worry. It was about like a one paragraph long message. It didn't have any pictures. It didn't say anything else. All what it said was, the aliens that were brought to the police station were chips. No need to worry. So apparently the, the military or the police or somebody rounded up some, some of those living aliens I was telling you about and brought them down to the police station. But really? that's the, I, I thought that was weird because it was dated July 10th, which is three days after the actual crash happened. Now, is there any record, any record at all of an alien being rounded up, as you put it, and brought in, you, you would think definitely that would be something the police would note. You know, alien walks in, got to make a report here. Um, I think we just got cut off. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Um, that was Jeremy Meter, and uh, obviously we've lost him. So it's a lesson in telephonics, folks. When we, uh, when we book our guests, we, uh, try and make absolutely certain that they're on a landline phone for a whole lot of good reasons. One of them was just demonstrated by that click you, you heard. That was, uh, his phone going away. So I don't know what to make of all of this. How about you? Obviously we've got a youngster here telling us a story that he's collected from a number of, um, a whole bunch of eyewitnesses, right? And he's got a little bit of physical evidence of some sort. He's got some photographs, which, by the way, Keith Rowland still does not uh, have. And I think we might have Jeremy back on the line. Jeremy, are you there? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, I'm on. Um, uh, I'm see, th this is why we don't like cell phones, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm putting the pictures up on a private website. I could send you the link to also if you want. No, wait, wait, wait a moment. Wait, wait a moment. Mm -hmm. I thought you were sending them to webmaster at artbell.com. I did send it. It says that they went through at – one second, it's loading. Because I, I checked with Keith uh, in our last break, and he had not yet received anything. Is there any way you could have Keith email me first and I reply to him and send it that way? Well, it's not too complicated, Jeremy. It's webmaster at it Art Bell. At, eight, at 841 and 825, it says that they were sent through. They were sent through. So you didn't get a bounce. I didn't get a bounce. 
But just in case, I upload them to a, to a, a website I can send you the link to, and you could do it that way. I don't know if uh-huh. that would be easier. Well, at this point, um, it's not but, it's not easy at all. Where did you send the? Are these photographs on the web now? Yeah, right now I'm putting them up right now. You're putting them up now. I'm and, putting it right now. And and where are they going to be, Jeremy? It's eliufocrash.webs.com. Ely UFO crash. Yep. And then a period and then W E B S dot com. I think I've got it. That's Ely U F hold on a second, Jeremy. Ely UFO crash. Period. Yeah. W E B S dot com. Yeah. Okay. That means we'll get them eventually. And it says that it was published right like a couple seconds ago, so it should be on there right. right now. All right. Um, Jeremy, is there anything else about this story uh, from the, the, the men in black encounter to the actual material evidence you have to the eyewitness reports that you have not told me about yet? Anything really important that we need to get on the air? Um, I'm thinking real quick. Um, well, I talked to the meteorology, the meteorology Society in Nevada for that day, and they said that there was clear skies, and it wasn't a meteor, because some people say that the blue gas behind it had it could have been a meteor. Well, they said that this couldn't have been a meteor because it was doing twists and turns, and it was being sighted for a while. And I guess the one to the north, like I said, started a forest fire, and the meteorologist, the meteor, sorry, it's getting tongue tied here. The society was saying that when meteors crash to the ground, they're cold to the touch, like you could pick them up. These both started fires. Um, okay, well, they're not, of course, going to be cold to the touch after they've traversed the atmosphere. Uh, they're, they're going to be very, very hot, right? Yeah, that's, they were saying that the, the, I don't know what you call it, the, the descriptions of it, had, they were similar to a meteor, but not exactly. Um, well, something I would like to like to say was the the crash in the 1970s or the, the UFO landing is separate from the 1950s incident, and the video that was on your website that the news station did that's actually a combination of both kind of put into one. Their facts are kind of mixed up on there. Okay. All right. So they didn't quite get it right. Yeah. Um. Well, something else I'd like to mention is Civilian and Project Blue Book both say that there was B-36 bombers flying low over the crash site, like, sim- like right after they happened, I guess. The one to the north sooner than the one to the south. But I guess there were these B-36s flying around, like, huh. circling the area. That's something else that I found was pretty interesting. All right. Um, is there anything further to be seen up there? If somebody goes into the Ely area now and finds – the site that you talked about. Are there still yeah. um are there still things to be picked up and to be seen? Um, if you go to the, the site that's near McGill and Cherry Creek, there are rocks similar to the one that I was given out there. I didn't want to take all of them, but there are similar rocks out there. I don't know. Okay, we're having trouble with our connection now. You still there? No. We've lost Jeremy again. So, sorry about that, Jeremy. Uh, I think we're going to call it at this point, and we're going to go to unscreened open lines. So go ahead and back there in uh, Washington, open up the lines, and uh, we'll give out the number, and we'll just go to unscreened open lines. Now, obviously, we just had a youngster on the air, and uh, a very enthusiastic youngster on the air. He's been looking at this for some time. I think probably he's on to something. I don't know what. I do know that the physical evidence should be examined. Um, There should be people who would go and speak to the witnesses and get some sort of description of what the creatures looked like. There would need to be a very great deal of follow-up to all of this for us to get it right. So I'm going to open up the uh, lines right now, and we're just going to take some open line calls, and you can talk about anything you want to talk about. If you want to comment on what Jeremy said, you're welcome to do it. Now, I will specify right at the top here that Jeremy didn't quite have it together in the sense that he kind of, I don't know, jumped around a little bit in the story, which made it difficult to understand on top of the bad line, but there's something here. Obviously, there's something here. 
So, if you'd like to call us, if you'd like to get on the air, uh, remember, if you want to wish me well, wish me back, it's Roswell's, please. The number is 855-REAL-UFO. That's 855-732-5836. And with that in mind, let's do it. Unscreened open lines. Uh, Dark Matter, you're on the air. I'm a little bit in the story. Uh, hello, my name is Teresa Freilicker. All right, Teresa, uh, turn your radio off, please. Yes, I just did. Okay. Excellent. And, and uh, am I speaking with Mr. Art Bell? You are. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I just sent you a message via um, the wormhole huh. at explaining, uh, trying to tell you about an episode that happened in the um, late 50s. There were three of us, um, Mary Jane Robinson, her mother Dorothy Robinson, and myself in rural Pennsylvania, Shippensburg. And um, we went shopping at a mall. Mary was getting ready to uh, go to nursing school, and she was buying a few things. And um, the stores closed at 10, and we were coming back to Shippensburg, and Mary hated driving on the Interstate 81, so we always took the rural back roads. And it was a perfectly clear night, a million stars visible, and um, some moonlight. And it was just, you know, a lovely drive. And out of nowhere, there were these lights uh, that came up behind us. And um, Mary thought somebody wanted to pay us, and she put her arm up out and, you know, and said, pay us, pay us, and she slowed down. And they didn't pay us. And, um, but they were close, and it was annoying her. So she stopped the car, and she said, she said, I, I want to find out what's going on. And her mother said, Mary, don't get out of this car. Don't uh, just stop. Let them go. Ignore them. And she said, no. She said, maybe something's wrong. Ever the caregiver, the nurse, Mary. Hmm. So, uh, and I also, and I was in the back seat. So and just I, like a scene out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. No, no, it no. wasn't. No, I don't think it was. But at any rate, I got out of the car as well. And I'm like, uh, I guess Mary was 18 and I was, I was 14. So I got out of the car also. And so I was on the um, passenger side of the car. Mary was on the driver's side of the car. And she walked to the rear of the car and I was already pretty much there. And there was this um, object, and there was no lights at this time. When we stopped and got out of the car, the lights were gone. <laughs> and you couldn't even see where there had been headlights or anything. It was perfectly smooth. And I'll tell you what triggered this. Um, the other night, uh, last night, when you had the guy on who said that the object that he saw that was black was like a, um, what did he describe it as? A, um, um, shoot. But at any rate, it wasn't square, it wasn't, um, oblong or like a hot dog or anything like that, but it sort of, it sort of had a rise in the center from the top as though it rose. The bottom appeared to be flat and the sides were curved but very smooth. So and you're I, saying, uh, you're saying it was a craft? It was a craft, yes, it was a craft. Some sort. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, but it was, there was not a sound at all, Mr. Bell. Not an engine, not a hum, not a nothing. Absolutely. All right, all right. So there are the two of you are standing there looking at this craft, and right. you should have been scared out of your minds at that point. Well, no, because we didn't feel threatened. I mean, I actually touched it. Really? And, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I was so fascinated with it because I, I didn't know what it, what it was made of. And um, um, I, in later years, I came to realize or think that it was like titanium. It was perfectly black, and the moonlight made it look shiny. Um, but it Okay, was well, so wait, we don't have a lot of time here. So what happened? Uh, did it take well, off? Did you take off or what? No, we did not take off. And Mary's saying, hello, did you want to talk to us? I'm not afraid. And I said, no, I'm not afraid either. Would really? you like to, I said, would you like to speak to us? Would you like to ask us questions? We'd like to ask you questions. Don't be afraid. Wow. We're not afraid. Well, we're kids, you know. I don't think I could have done that. Honestly, oh. I don't. 
Well, we did not feel. Now, Mary's mother is in the front street, in the front seat, <laughs> crying hysterically. Get in the car. Get in the uh -huh. car. I don't like this. I'm frightened. And Mary says, Ma, shut up. <laughs> and um so, all right listen we're about out of time here but what did the craft take off or did well, you just this, drive away this or? is the thing that was amazing it just lifted straight up ah. without making a sound and it then elevated as if to go up but while it was with us just right in front of us it wasn't it wasn't we weren't a foot from it i mean i could put my arm out and touch it <laughs> and um it just lifted straight up and then sort of took off. And as it took off, um, lights around it started circling and uh, different colors, and we could see people inside, and we waved. We waved goodbye. People. People. Well, people <laughs> as in creatures. Yeah. Not, I mean, not, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Human yeah. or non, human or non-human? They were too far away, but they appeared to be somewhat human. They had heads, necks, shoulders, arms. And the one thing that Mary said was, they don't have five fingers. And, see, I wasn't looking at the fingers. And uh, and we were waving to them saying goodbye, goodbye, and they waved back to us. Huh. The, thing, the thing that's interesting is ever since that episode, I've been intuitive. I'm an intuitive well, it obviously then affected you in some manner and may have set that off. Uh, I don't know. That's fascinating. There you have a first-hand account of what I would call close encounter of the third kind, right? When you're that close, when you can put your hand on a craft, and when you can wave to the whatever they are is in there, I would say that's a, a close encounter of the third kind or whatever. Wow. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Is this Art? It is. Art, my name's Mike. I'm in Virginia. Hi. I, I work the water on the Chesapeake Bay, and we constantly see strange objects flying in the sky. I've tried to videotape them, and none of them have ever appeared on my uh, videotape. Well, unless you've got a really new camera and it's really good with low light, uh, you're not going to get very much. Um, it's really hard to take any video, meaningful video at night, and then end up with anything more than a light. I don't even end up with light. That's the, the whole thing. Really? Nothing appears on the, the film or on the video at all. Hmm. And you've done this I how many times? Oh, I five, six, seven times in the last year. Wow. It just, we see all kinds of strange stuff out here at night, working the water. And we've tried to videotape it, and we can never get it to show up on the tape. Well, I, I'll say this, um, and I've had two experiences. Both I think I've described uh, to you at various times. And in both cases, I did not have a camera with me. In both cases... I was so shocked and so transfixed, you know, where I was, that um, I never would have thought of it. Never, never, never. Um, it would be great to say, I had a camera right there on the backseat. Could have grabbed it, could have taken a picture, could have had the proof, wished I'd had the proof, but didn't. So I do understand. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Dark, is it you? Uh, it is me, yes. Oh, it's great to hear you back on the air. Thank you. So, no, I'm just, I'm just curious, like, how do you, and, and talking in general, like, how do you not dispute everything going on here? I don't know what you mean. How, how do I not dispute what's going on? What do you mean? Oh, oh, no, sorry. Like, it's... Between pyramids and all this other stuff, it's this ancient alien thing. Doesn't that make complete sense? Only if you put it in context. What are you saying? He's gone. I think he knew what he wanted to say. He just couldn't figure out how to say it. Dark matter, you're on the air. Hi. I don't know what you mean. How do I not dispute what's going on with yes. Roswell? Right, Roswell. Uh, one thing about all these different crafts, and there's a lot of different descriptions, but uh, if these 
uh, aliens can come across hundreds of thousands of light years, couldn't they have the technology to navigate through our atmosphere? Why are they always crashing? It's a very good question, um, and I guess the answer might be the only ones we get to talk about and see are the ones that have a problem. You know, if they don't have a problem, then they're up and gone. Well, uh, I guess I've got to have a problem every now and then. Now, maybe that craft that came back to uh, look at the crash site was looking for survivors. Maybe it was a rescue mission. Entirely possible, sure. Hey, uh, very, very good shows. I've really enjoyed last week. Yeah, the, the, the professor was incredible there, so keep up the good work, Art. Thanks, you. All right, thank you very much, and uh, take care. Of course, we had a couple of professors on, so I would assume that you're perhaps talking about Dr. Uh, Kaku. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Uh, is this the screener? No, I don't have a screener. Oh, this Art. I'm sorry, Art. Hey, I want to ask you a question. Uh, yes. Are you going to have a show here recently about Rod? Um, you're talking about Jose Escamilla, right? Exactly. The, the, the rods that you, know, you see out of the corner of your eye. Okay, rods are not so much seen uh, in the corner of your eye. Rods no. are actually able to be photographed. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, no, no. Uh, actually, what I'm thinking about was the um, the um, shadow Sh- people. shadow people. Yes, they they uh, they come to the corner of your eye. Rods. <laughs> yeah, they, rods are, are the white streaks that you can. Yeah, see. they're they're moving very quickly. Exactly. Uh, what what is your what is your what is your point of view about that, sir? Do you think that the rods are the real McCoy, or do you think they're, a lot of people say, for example, they're bugs. No, no uh, Art, I've, I've seen them oh, a thousand times. I mean, uh, I've had, I mean, rods and shadow, shadow people, but the rods, um, I, I see them all the time. It's the white streaks in front of my eyes. I mean, I, I actually see them. I don't know, I mean. I think most people, I think most people do not see rods, that they're too okay. quick for the eye. Uh we all see a little thing that I think floats across our eye every now and then, if that's what you're talking about. That may be but, an eye floater, yes. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> all right, all right, thank you very much. But uh, what he was really talking about, that's a whole other subject, Ron. Jose Escamilla is a very interesting guy, and he's put together, I think, um, absolute proof that these rods really do exist, that they are some sort of life form, and they can be photographed. Uh, with very high speed film, and he's got lots and lots of uh, photographs, even video of rods. Uh, there's a particularly impressive one, which occurred in a cave, and these rods were flying all about this cave. It's really amazing. Anyway, listen, we're going to break here. We're in open lines now, and anything you want to talk about is fair game. I'm Art Bell, and this <laughs> this is Dark Matter. certainly are doing that. They're all lit up. Welcome back, everybody. My guest was Jeremy Meter. He talked about a UFO crash in Ely, Nevada, just north of me. Well, quite a bit north of me, but still here in Nevada. And I'd like to know a lot more about it. So if anybody has anything to contribute to the uh, Jeremy Meter story, I'd love to get it so we can track this down. If it really is a Nevada... Um, UFO, if it really is a Nevada Roswell, I guess would be the way to put it. I definitely want to know more about it, so hopefully you'll get the information to me. By the way, did you hear about the bombs that were dropped on North Carolina? These weren't any bombs. These were hydrogen bombs. That was occurred a long time ago, 1961, but we were just told about it. New document tells us. The B-52 apparently uh, disintegrated in midair, and the hydrogen bombs dropped. They landed on North Carolina, not out in the ocean, but actually on North Carolina. Now, fortunately for us, (laughs) there are four safety features on hydrogen bombs. Four. Three of them, you will be unhappy to hear, failed. That's right. Three of them failed. 
Only one tiny thing stood between, well, what happened, harmlessly falling to the ground, and hydrogen bombs a couple hundred times uh, more powerful than those that hit Hiroshima from going off. Do you know what that thing was? A little tiny safety switch. I think uh, just a few volts. If a low voltage switch had gone, and that would have, that means just a few volts drop or a few volts added, either way, the hydrogen bomb would have gone off and North Carolina would have basically disappeared along with Maryland, Washington, South Carolina, probably Georgia. In other words, a very great deal of our East Coast would have gone up. You hesitate to say in smoke, but uh, up in smoke. And that would have been it. And we're just now told about it back in 1961. Can you imagine that? Okay, let's go here and say, Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hi. Uh, good show tonight. Thank you. Uh, I used to, when I was a kid, I was pretty skeptical about this kind of stuff. You know, there's UFOs at. Ain't no such thing. But, uh, one summer night, we're just when I was 18, right out of high school, my old friend and I, we were, you know, doing what you know teenagers do, you know, getting into mischief. Sure. And we then we see this big blue thing. One one second it's a dark sky, next second here's this big blue thing just sitting in front of us. You know, I'd stay there for all less than a minute, and I mean, all of a sudden it was just gone. When you say right in front of you, you mean really close or what? There, I'd say it was. I mean, like like. Not right in front of us, but I mean, it had a little bit of distance, but it just sat there and had, there was no sound, no nothing, just this big blue ball. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was just gone. Well, after that, hell, I've been, I've been a believer ever since. Well, there's nothing like having your own experience. And, uh, according to surveys, most Americans, I believe, have had their own experience. A majority of Americans have seen or been in close contact with something that they can't explain. Yep. And we checked the papers and the news the next day. There was nothing reported. So uh, my buddy and I, we decided, well, maybe we'll just sit on this and keep it to ourselves and not tell nobody about it. <laughs> Probably a wise decision. Thank you very much. Another thing that I would like to complain about or make note of, and that is that, um, you know, with social media now, everybody's on Facebook, right? Everybody's twitching about <laughs> Twitter, all of these different, um, or on the computer. And when you're on the computer, when you're on Facebook, when you're doing the social media thing, you're not looking up. And that's one of the main reasons that people don't see UFOs. Take our sky here in Nevada. Very clear. On any given night, you can see Key Way from one horizon all the way to the other horizon. That clear. Millions of stars. And if you sit outside and spend a little less time on Facebook or your computer or whatever you're doing and actually look up, you're going to see something. Now, it may not be as dramatic as some of what you've heard about here, but you're going to see something. You'll just have to wait for a while. It may turn out to be a satellite. It may turn out to be an airplane. It may turn out to be something strange. And you may see a UFO. But one thing's for sure. If you're on Facebook, you're not going to see it. Dark matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Going once. Going twice. Gone. Dark matter, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, uh, am I on the air? You are. Oh, wow, Art Bell, right? Yes. Oh, wow, okay. I, didn't, <laughs> I never expect I would be on the air, ever, actually. Okay, <laughs> well, here you are. All right, awesome. Well, my name's, uh, my name's Tony from Dallas, Texas. Right. And so I, pretty much I just wanted to just give you a um, pretty much calling about a paranormal experience I had last year um, at, a, at a cemetery in McKinney, Texas. It's in north of Dallas. Okay, this and, is, you said a paranormal experience, right? That's correct. And you're at a cemetery? That's correct. Yes. 
So basically, um, basically me, my girlfriend, and a couple of other friends too. Uh, we went out to the cemetery called Ross Cemetery in McKinney, Texas. So the crazy thing about it is, um, uh, usually I I am a skeptic, but at the same time I can be a believer at the same time, but only if truth is right to presented in front of me, something that's undisputable. And definitely, I can definitely tell you tonight that I actually have definitive proof. Of, uh, of an EVP that I actually uh, that one of my friends actually captured, and I wasn't really too far. Wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 stop, 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 hold, hold on, hold on. You All have right. definitive, hold on, you have definitive proof of an ET that you captured. Of a e- EVP. Oh. Of a, of a voice. Of a voice. Okay. All right. Yeah, All right. I, so I, you I, you were in uh, you were in a graveyard and you had a recorder with you. That's right. Well, my friend had it recorded. It was actually from his cell phone, but you can actually hear it very well. Actually, I have uploaded it on the website um, a couple of, I want to say sometime last week, because um, I've always been very, um, I've been very scared. I, honestly, that's the way I felt. I've always been kind of very scared, kind of shied away to see if I could put out uh, paranormal evidence out to my friends. Okay, you know, what you're talking they, about is, okay, you're talking about an electronic voice phenomenon. Um, that's you were in, Okay. Do you actually do you have it with you right now? Yes, I do. Um, I can actually email you the link, um, whatever email I can send it to, or I'll yeah, just, I, I say, just play it, play it. Let me hear. It. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sure. Let me just grab it real quick. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. Give me. Give me uh, we're going to do it. Yeah, I'm waiting. Um, I'll wait. We we will do a show on EVP, electronic voice phenomena. And oh, this wow. man went. This man went to a graveyard, and apparently somebody had a recorder going on a phone. And captured what you're about to hear. Right here it is, right here. Let me just go ahead and skip over to the last minute because it's a three minute and thirty nine second EVP. But let me go and skip over to the last minute of it because you can definitely hear it. Um, look, look for something that that says something. Um, whispering, come out and play. Here it is. All right. And three, two, one, here it is. All I hear is hiss. Did you hear that, Art? No. Let me try it one more time for you. Follow me. Okay. All I heard was hiss. Let's see. Oh, I did hear it. I did hear it. Again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's said oh, it twice. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a little easy. hard to hear, but I heard it. Well, man. Yeah, and then and that last part, my friend uh, saying you bore me. Uh, the crazy thing is that the cemetery is extremely old, very, very extremely old. Um, I want to say we found graves going back to the 1700s, late 1700s mm-hmm. on that. Um, it's 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 always scared me hearing this voice. It always gives me chills. Um, I've always been somewhat of a skeptic, but at the same time a believer. I, I guess you could say you could catch me in the middle, um, depending on if evidence is there. And I'm glad I actually found this evidence. I'm glad you did too, and I'm glad you played it for us. Uh, probably would have been better out, you know, of course, directly coming over. But I, I could hear it. EVP has a long, rich history. I have some friends that we're going to have on the show. Uh, they have some family difficulty right now, but uh, uh, they're going to come on the show, and they've been playing EVP for years for me. And all it requires is a recorder. I guess you can use your phone. It doesn't matter if it's digital or if it's tape. And what you do is take it with you to, if you have the cojones for it, into a graveyard or a haunted place, and you let it run. And if you're lucky... I mean, that's what you want, and you're lucky. You will hear a voice telling you something. Now, I don't know where this comes from. What I do know is that it goes all the way back to Alexander Graham Bell. He was investigating this. He had voices that appeared on his recording mechanisms. And frankly, they're very, very scary sometimes. So if you want to play around with this kind of thing, it's it's better than Ouija board. And uh, more fun to play with. You just start a recording going in a place that you think might be haunted and see what you get. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hi. 
Yeah, hey, Art, how you doing? Okay, sir. Um, I got a quick story. I was in uh, California, and uh, I was basically babysitting my mom's apartment. She had taken a, a week vacation to Las Vegas, right. and I was laying on the couch watching TV, and she had a big mirror on a mantle above the fireplace, and I had the sliding glass door shut. You know, there was no wind, and the uh, mirror, like, blew off about three or four feet. And it shattered, and it shattered face, the, with the mirror facing up, and it scared the heck out of me. And um, I called my mom in Vegas, and I said, "Hey, you know, the mirror just fell off." And she had gotten woken up, uh, basically at the same time, hearing footsteps walking across, you know, by her bed. You know, so it was a weird, you know, thing at the same time because I called her 30 seconds after the mirror had crashed. You know, and, and I figure, if, you know, if there was any wind, the uh, the mirror would have just went straight down. So what? Well, yeah, okay. So what do you think it was? I I don't know. Um, I spoke to a lady who does paranormal investigations, and she was saying that a lot of spirits are using mirrors as a portal. Right. And I was yeah. like, well, why would they break it? You know. I wonder. Anyway, you know, I wonder. I wonder what it is about a mirror. That lends itself to paranormal occurrences. That's a very interesting question, actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. And I've I've stayed at her house before, and like, in, it's just a small one bedroom apartment, you know. And in the hallway between her room to the bathroom, I've seen you know dark figures like, you know, shoot across the little entrance to get into the hallway, the little doorway. So mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but it's weird that that crashed. And then I called her, and she got woken up by footsteps walking by her bed, and there was nobody there. Yeah, so I'm, it, kind of, it scared me, you know, so I couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> I understand completely. Thank you. What is it? Uh, I, I'm sure somebody out there can help with this. What is it about mirrors, even staring into them, that seems to heighten the paranormal possibilities? Anybody have any ideas? I suppose we could talk about looking into your own soul, self-examination, I really don't know, but there is something about mirrors, isn't there? Somebody out there will know. Hello there, Dark Matter, you're on the air. Yes, do we talk about shadow people? Uh, we can indeed. Uh, turn, okay. turn, your radio, turn your radio off, please. Oh, well, I'm, uh -huh. I'm, it doesn't always go on. There, that should be off now. Um, I believe that I was touched by a shadow person, or I should say I believe one ruined my death. You, one did in, what? I'm sorry, one did what? Ruined my death. I, back in 1990, I had created this scenario where I was extremely depressed and was going to end my life. Yes. I blew up my trailer, literally. Mm -hmm. My God. And uh, as I was being shoved to the floor from the pressure of the trailer exploding, this black figure appeared beside me picked me literally off the floor, said it is not your time to die, and threw really? me through the wall. Wow. I think I think and believe that shadow people are here to be our guardians. Well, that one was there for you, that's for sure. I, I don't know if they're all like that. Thank you very much for the call. All right. That uh, creature, or whatever it was, saved him. Do I think they're here for that generally? I don't know. wonder if anybody else has had a similar experience. Anybody out there actually been saved by one of these creatures? And again, let us define a shadow person. I know, chuckle, chuckle, right? But a shadow person, it begins in the corner of your eye. Almost everybody has had this experience. You're watching, I don't care, a computer screen. Some people think actually looking at a computer screen produces visions of, of shadow people, and I'll explain why. It has a certain refresh rate, and your eyes and your brain begin to get adjusted to this refresh rate. It's actually flickering. You don't know that. You don't see it. Trust me. It's flickering at a certain and that does something to your brain. It begins to allow you to see something else. And by something else, I mean a movement that occurs in your peripheral vision. The other. One eye or the other. 
and you see something move quickly across that peripheral vision. Not directly, although there have been certainly sightings of shadow people directly. These generally are in your peripheral vision. And as for me, I'd just soon have them stay there. At any rate, that's what the gentleman is talking about. Pretty scary stuff. Shadow people. Peripheral vision. Surely you, you've seen something in the corner of your eye, right? <laughs> Wonder what it was. Well, all right, we're in open lines. Anything you want to talk about is fair game, and I mean anything. You've already had a little sampling. These things will go anywhere. You just never know. Anyway, you've got the number. I've got the pointer. And hello there. Dark Matter says you're on the air. Hey, is this Art Bell? It is. Hey, there, Roswell. Thank you. All right. Hey, um, this, my name is Brian D. And I just need some closure on something. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Now, when I was young, maybe about like eight years old, um, I had a little uh, thing that went on with me uh, as a child. I saw it like the house. I don't know that I was living in or what was going on. But a lot of like strange things used to happen to me. And my mom used to like beat me and stuff like that because she didn't know like the strange things. Uh, strange things like what? All right. Like, well, she used to say I used to sleepwalk. But when I was a child, I used to like get up, uh, things had me pulling me out my bed. Had me walk around, touching four corners of my bed. I couldn't stop. Um, things mm-hmm. to like open my doors. I'm walking through my house in the middle of the night, uh, like a force. But had me going down the steps, all the way through the living room, the dining room, down to the dark, you know, part of the basement. I'm seeing white things flying around me and all this stuff. In the back of the basement, it's like a red light. You never had a red light in the back of the basement. It was always a green light. And it was a furnace be back there, and the furnace would, like, breathe. And it was like a force that had me coming to the – it's like I snap out of it, and I run and start running up the steps. And it's like something was, like, grabbing me and pulling me back down the steps. And somehow, some way, I used to run upstairs and make it back into my room. Um, and I used to always tell my mom this stuff, and my mother would never believe me, but she knew something was going on with me. And she didn't like the fact that I used to uh, tell my um, – my uh, my aunts and my uncles and them and, that, and they used to uh, joke at me and laugh and say I was crazy and stuff. So one day we had an incident where when my little cousin and his mother came over our, came over our house and me and my cousin in the hallway playing with this um, with this orange basketball and he passed the ball to me. The ball bounced off off me, went down the first flight of steps, then went down the other flight of steps. Now we argue about who's gonna go down there and get the ball, and I already knew that strange things was going on um, in the house. So we both went down the foot by the steps. We turned around, and there's, like, this guy. I call him Mr. Hyde, like the doctor Jack with Mr. Hyde. Like yes. Mr. Hyde. And he was, he, had, he was dressed up in all black, in the all black and white suit with this white, um, with this black, with the black hat, with the little white band going around. Him. And he was holding the basketball in his hand. And he <laughs> had the other hand, and he had the other hand, which was like, and he was like telling me to come here, to come here. And, and you were how old then? This was when I was like eight or nine years old. And a force was making me come down to start making me go down the steps, and I couldn't stop myself. And I'm turning back, looking at my cousin, and he's sitting there just looking at me. And I'm going down the steps. I got so close to the um to the thing, his eyes was pearly white, uh, was pearly black. I could see my own reflection off the guy. I remember this stuff always vividly to this to this very moment because. Can't nobody has nobody helped me with uh, like what's going on, and uh, anyway, um, and, yeah. and I'm afraid I'm 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 listen. I there's no way I'm going to be able to give you closure in a situation like that. Um, I'm sorry that happened to you, but in terms of my giving you closure, not going to happen. That sounds like the sort of thing that you would run by, you know, a hypnotist who would regress you and try and find out what actually happened. I had a sister who sleepwalked, and it was really scary and really eerie and kind of dangerous. I um, wonder how many of the rest of you have had family members who sleepwalk. It's eerie. It really, really is eerie to see somebody sort of, uh, because they're in 
I don't know, a trance-like state. And you don't know what to do to wake them up, uh, to not wake them up. Usually the best thing is try to get them back to bed without uh, waking them if you're able to do it. But, uh, you know, most times you really have to. Um, hello, Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, this is Jim. Hi, Jim. Hey, I've huh? got a story about glowing feet. Glowing feet? Sure. Sure. Whenever I was uh, about 2001, I'm trying to call Art for ever since then. But anyway, my wife and my kids kept telling me they were seeing something go back and forth across the hallway in the back of our double wide there from one room to the other. I always thought they was nuts because I never, never saw anything. But I would sit in the living room chair one day by myself and my chihuahua. He jumps right. out of my lap, runs down the hallway, just barking with his hair raised up. I still don't see anything down there. But I did see a light under the door. But my wife swears to God she called me when I was on the road one night and says that she saw the glowing feet go from one room to the other. Mm-hmm. So I went back there with my children, and they have covered their mirrors up in all their rooms because they're all so convinced that that's where they were coming from. The mirrors. Yeah, the mirrors. And we no longer live there, and we no longer have any problems like that. But the whole entire time we lived there, my kids were terrified to stay in a two-back bedroom. wonder what it is about mirrors. All right, well, listen, thank you very, very much for the story. I'm not sure what to make out of it. Glowing feet. And I guess that's all there was. No body. Glowing feet. And out of a mirror. Again. There's something about a mirror. I'm, I'm trying to remember. You know, I've, over the years I've interviewed people about this, and there is something about a mirror, and I know one of you will come up with it. I can't re- recall it uh, just offhand. Dark matter, you're on the air. How you doing, Art? Doing fine, sir. First of all, I want to say Roswell. Thank you. First time caller, long time listener, and I just want to say thank you so much for choosing to come back on the air. It's, you made my nights complete now. Okay, thank you. That's Roswell's. Um, I, I I found it fascinating. The guy called about the mirror. Right. I, I had an incident my wife and I did at the house we we bought here probably about no about a year and a half ago. We was up in the bedroom and about one o'clock in the morning. We're just laying in bed, getting ready to go to sleep, and something sounded like it was wiggling the door on the closet. <laughs> yes. And I sat up in the bed and I looked at that and I was like, looked at her. So you hear that? She goes, Yeah. And I was like, What in the world? And it just kept wiggling, and I was getting ready to get out of bed to go see what it was. And my wife grabs me. She goes, no, 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 no. I says, well, something's obviously in there. I, I, I don't know what, but anyway, the door just opened. <laughs> door handle to open, you know, and I was just, I, I was flabbergasted. I was just like, what, what, what you know. And uh, anyway, we had a mirror, one of those long rectangle mirrors she does on that door. And just as that door opened, that mirror cracked. And I wonder. I wonder what it is about mirrors. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, there's something that yeah, has to do with paranormal and mirrors. I don't know what it is. I don't either. You know, the the the, the gal I talked to, uh, a paranormal specialist, she said that you know she she said basically the same thing. Because I, I can't quite describe it, but she says I believe that they use like some sort of like a portal for it. You know, and uh, my wife and I are. Well, you know, this just happened roughly. I would say three weeks ago, and we've just kind of been tossing around because she's like, I really like to come over to your house and and do some, you know, EVPs and stuff like that, you know, and my wife's just kind of like, I just particularly don't think I want people in my house overnight, but I was like, I think it'd be cool just to find out. If- I guess it would. I, I really don't know. I, I here's, here's the way to think about it. EVPs are creepy. I'm sorry, but there's no other uh, right way to put it. They're creepy. When you hear a voice, a disembodied voice, coming out of a, a recorder of any sort, it's creepy. If you heard that, well, this was recorded in a graveyard, it's really creepy. If you heard this is recorded here in your house, then it's creepy to the point of, hey, let's think about moving. So I don't really, I wouldn't really want to hear an EVP from my house. Thank you very much. How about the rest of you? Any thoughts on that? You're on Dark Matter and on the air. Hi. Hello. 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 Hello.
Hello there. Oh, hey, am I, I'm on the air. Hey, yes, you are. Oh, great. Uh, my name is uh, Patrick. I'm from Georgia. Yes, Patrick. And uh, I just uh, want your opinion. You're breaking on, up, Patrick. You're breaking up. <laughs> oh, can you can you hear me? I hear you, but you're every now and then breaking up pretty badly. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, you. I've been listening to your show uh, for a long time, and uh, you uh, talk about subjects about uh, you know uh, things that go bump in the night and all sorts of weird manner of people and things. And I was just wondering if you had heard about these uh, these people who dress up in animal costumes and run around the place called furries. Furries. Yeah, they 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 dress up as all sorts of different animals and go to conventions. I don't know if it's paranormal. Oh, it's, I, it's definitely extra normal. <laughs> Are they trekkies? No, I kind of. I don't know. They they just they're <laughs> crazy things. I don't know. But um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I was just uh, well. Just, let's I try just, this. Are you a furry? Well, well, I don't. know. Come on, let's let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. What do you dress? What do you dress up as? Oh uh, well, let's see. Sometimes. Uh, now we're getting to it. Here. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes it's a lion. A yeah. lion. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you dress up as a lion, do you find that people um, are surprised? Do they get upset? Do they laugh? Well, yeah, do they run? They, no. Well, they they laugh. They seem they seem to like it. Seems to be a, a thing that makes people happy. It's a happy, it's a, it's a happy suit. It's nothing. It's not like a voodoo mask. It's a, it looks like a football team mascot. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's okay if you're on a football field. But you know, if <laughs> if if you're in somebody's living room, it might they might be very upset. Just break through the wall. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, exactly. All right. Uh, so there you have it. A furry. How many other furries are out there? The Lord only knows. People who like to slip that fur burden thing over their head and go and see the neighbors. <laughs> That's funny, furries. Hi there, Dark Matter. You're on the air. Hello, Art. How are you doing? Hello. Just fine, sir. Where hey, Where are you? This is Bill. I'm in the high desert in California. <laughs> okay. I need to start asking people where they are. Okay. Go ahead. That's where I'm from. Anyhow, I know all about Ely, Nevada. Uh, I was responsible for all the electronic systems that went from California to Utah, including that radar site that was on top of that mountain looking down into Ruth. You're telling me that you know all about Ely? I know all about the town of Ely, the surrounding area of Ely, Cherry Creek. I've yeah, been but, there. Yeah, but you, you, know about, you know about the crash? No. I don't know about the crash, and I went up there for 25 years. And no one up there could ever tell me about it. I've been to the railroad museum. I've gone through it a few dozen times. Have you heard have about the crash? I've never found anyone that could tell me about the crash. I'm sorry, but I wanted to let you know there are a lot of miners up there. So if anybody goes there up there to check things out, be very careful. Uh, that, that, anyway, you are right. This was in, 9, in July of 52. Yeah, I wasn't there that? then. Okay. No, I, was, I, I worked for the military, for the Air Force at Edwards Air Force Base. And so for 20 years, I had to go up there at least six times a year and spend a week or two up there because I had 19 sites, microwave sites, including that right. radar site from Utah right. back to Edwards and across Area 51. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had one that looked right down over Area 51. <laughs> I used to go up there, and after the helicopters let me through, after I finished my work that I had to do, well, I would wait, wait a minute, wait. Why did the helicopters let you through? Because I was authorized, I have a site on top of the mountain that looks down over Area 51. Well, okay, then you can probably tell me quite a bit bit about Area 51, right? I can just tell you kind of what it looks like from sitting on top of the mountainside looking down at it with binoculars eating my lunch. Well, almost everybody can do that, right? Binoculars, mountainside. You can't get up on top of the mountain anymore. They've got all those roads blocked off, and a black helicopter comes out to check you out when you drive up there. You know, okay, well, what have you seen? I've seen just things on the ground, normal things, regular things, nothing unusual, no flying saucers there. I've had B-52s fly over me at 100 feet going up and down those valleys, up through those valleys up in there. Boy, but I've never seen 
any UFOs, and I've never seen anything unusual. Now, I might have seen some of the uh, uh, the stealth fighters when they were coming along, you know, when they were initially oh. being tested. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Now you've seen stealth fighters. Oh, yeah, I've seen the stealth fighters, the stealth bombers. I've seen all that. <laughs> but, but that no. doesn't help you out as far as the crash goes. I'm sorry. I've never seen anything about that. I hope there's something there. Uh, and I used to have to drive right up to Cherry Creek, and uh, <laughs> there is no big towns up there. It's just one or two buildings. There might be some people in them here and there. The okay. railroad is still there. That railroad was used to haul the ore from the Ruth Mine, which was the largest co open copper pit mine, up to McGill, which was the processing plant for processing ore into gold and silver. All right. Well, you heard Jeremy Meter's story. Yes, uh, I did. About it, right? Yes, I did. Um, other than the fact that he was a little splintered in the way he told it, did you, what did you think of the story? It was a very interesting story. Uh, he was a little bit discombobulated, but other than that, if he had gotten a little more into it or knew more about the area, I don't know. I knew a lot of the areas he talked about, but then, uh, anyhow, I think, you know, I think it's, it's a good possibility, but I'd never heard of it. And I've been nor, there, nor had I. Nor had I. I. Many times, many times, and talked to all the people in town. I knew the people in the newspaper. I kn all right, I'll tell you what. The next time you go up there, ask about this. All right? I will. I will. All right, definitely. Yep. All right. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Please do that. In other words, if you really do frequent the area and know people up there, then by all means, just say, hey, listen, I wonder if you know anybody who knows about a crash, a UFO crash that was said to have occurred here back in 1952. In other words, don't uh, don't come at it, you know, kind of like you're an MIB or something. Just, you know, kind of casually say, what do you know? Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Hey, hello. Roswell? Thank you. Yes. Vinny Roswell, this is Levi Th from Tulsa calling in. About Levi. About question on the mirrors. Yes, sir. And I've always had a lifelong fascination with the occult, and I'm also uh, practice witchcraft. And the reason why we use mirrors is because they are a portal. They allow you to see the reverse and the opposite side. Which and is like they, they, I take it they allow the opposite side to see you. Yes. yes. Uh, the fact is, one, a couple of uh, more well-known among some circles is like when you're summoning a djinn, you use a mirror as a primary source. Right. And then they can see you, you can see them through that kind of discussion. Same with, like, scrying. The mirror allows you to see the other side. Scrying, that's it, yes. So, yeah, that's pretty much the re main reason why people use mirrors is between, and why the paranormal is attracted to them is it allows you to see the other side of the portal. What have you seen through mirrors? <sighs> I've, me, personally, I've seen a few paranormal experiences. Mostly friendly ghosts, I hope. I usually keep a lot of my mirrors covered in my house because of that reason. Because oh, I've really? also, yeah, because I'm also attuned to the supernatural, so I get senses, I get feelings, I see glimpses, like they're trying to talk to me. My family trades for a while. The only thing I want to see in a mirror is myself, and I'm not wild about that. Yeah, um, if you're not open to it, or you tell them they're not welcome, usually they don't come to the mirror. But uh, you have to reinforce that they only come when you want them to. Otherwise, I'm going to try and remember that. Uh huh. In other words, mirror, mirror on the wall. Don't show me anybody else at all. <laughs> uh, you could do it that <laughs> way. You, usually, when I'm when I'm dealing with them, I just tell them in a firm voice, "Please leave, not right now." And usually, I don't have to worry about them after that. All right. Well, I'll, I'll certainly keep that in mind. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Mirror, mirror on the wall. No, thank you. I've seen it all. Don't want any moving figures, no wispy figures, no ghosts, no goblins. I'm not sure what we're talking about right now. Sort of a little bit of everything. It's called Open Lines. It's called Unscreened Open Lines. So anything that you want to talk about is fair game. That's what it's really all about. <laughs> that goes just me. Hi there, you're on Dark Matter. Hello, Mr. Bell. Uh, great Hi. to talk to you, sir. 
Uh, great to talk to you. Sounds like you're uh, moving right along in a truck. Oh, yes, sir, I am. Yes, sir, I'm down here in Texas. I, okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, back about 15 years ago, you had a, uh, had a recording supposedly from hell. And uh, I wondered if maybe you could replay that because it really affected me a lot. And I really wanted you uh, to hear about that again. You really don't want to hear that, do you? Well, not necessarily, but I remember it had a terrible effect on me. And I, it, it was, seemed like something I'd heard before. And it was really a... And it, it troubled me. I mean, I still remember it from 15 years ago when I was like a kid. Right. Are you really sure you want to hear that? In the dark, in the nighttime, in a truck, in Texas? Well, yes, sir, if, if there's some kind of uh, explanation to what it is. I mean, All if right. that's... All right, all right. You wish, you receive. Um, in the night, to just stay there, don't hang up. Are you still there? Good. All yes, right. sir. In the 1980s, Russian scientists in Siberia were performing a series of borehole experiments. These digs were typically performed for purposes of geotechnical investigation and the location of rare mineral deposits. But in this case, the geologists in Russia simply wanted to see how deep they could go. This is a true incident, or at least a reported incident. It was in the wire service. Uh, their experiment began without incident, but when their drill reached the nine-mile mark, that would be deeper than anyone had ever drilled before, its rotation became erratic. They had apparently drilled into a hollow opening underground. Inside the cavern, temperature sensors read upwards of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It was then they decided to send a microphone down to gather more data. The microphone only lasted about 30 seconds in the heat of the cavern before malfunctioning. But in those 30 seconds, the scientists caught something incredible on tape. Yes, sir, I remember it very clearly. That's it. You really sure you wanted to hear that, huh? Well, I remember it very clearly, but I'd always wondered if hell was maybe more trans-dimensional than than something that was just in the middle of the earth. Listen, I don't know what it is. Um, It's horrible. and um, horrible. And it sounds like hell to me. I had to pull over to the side of the road. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad glad you've enjoyed it. Well, I don't know if I enjoyed it, but thank you so much, Mr. Bell, and thank you so much for coming back. Quick question. Yes, sir. You figure that's where you're headed? No, sir. You sure about that? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. It's it easier to listen to then. Okay, thank you very much for the call. Have a good night. Well, you wanted to hear it. There have been many who say that's baloney. And it's hogwash, and it's made up, and it's this and it's that. But it is what it is. Same recording from years ago. It was a legit wire story. And it may be so much hogwash, or maybe not. You decide. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Um, Hi. Uh, this is uh, Ward calling from Running Springs, California. Hey, Ward. Hey, uh, I wanted to say Uber Rosals and 51s from Bell Gap. <laughs> Uber Roswells. I got um, Thank you. That's that's fine. And thank you for saving us from uh, ten years of snoring on the radio. Um, I wanted to actually uh, tell you that you know a lot of us have been living on your old shows in MP3 format, and you've discussed some things in there that you talked about, but you really didn't go into detail. So could you discuss? Um, I have three questions for you here. 
any of your closet experiences, any of your red eye experiences, or any wait, of wait, 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 one, one thing at a time. What do you mean closet experiences? Well, you said you were really afraid as a kid of the closet door being open, and you still can't sleep with the closet door open. I don't. Uh, I close the closet door, but I've never had any really negative experience, and the reason is because I close the damn thing. <laughs> well, what about what about your Ouija board story or red eyes? Um, Ouija board, I won't talk about. Red eyes are awful, absolutely awful. I mean, the, the worst thing that you could see in the dark in the night would be a pair of red eyes. If you do see them, then probably you're headed for, well, you heard what I played there a minute ago, right? Yeah, frightening stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Appreciate the call, sir. Thank you, Art. Thank you, and take care. I've always been ill-disposed to red eyes, red glowing eyes. As a matter of fact, there was a story of a chupacabra. I think it turned out to be a dog. I'm not really sure. But part of the description of what this guy saw, he shot what he thought was a chupacabra. And they're still arguing, I think, about what it was. But it had red glowing eyes. Don't like red eyes. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Uh, welcome back. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Maker Roswell to you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, I've got an EVP story for you. Okay. Uh, my mom and dad, when I was uh, a young boy, were they were involved in uh, uh, playing around with people that, you know, mess around with white witchcraft and beach boards. Uh, and tarot and such. My mom mm. has a copy on, I know you remember the old reel for reel. Sure. She played it for me during one of these sessions, I guess, that they were with their friends. And on the tape, you could hear, uh, the only way I could describe it would be in a whisper, but uh, a loud enough whisper, but not a, I would say, evil. Uh, and you could hear two things being said, saying, shut the door and leave the key. Shut the door and, and leave, and I'm sorry, and leave the key? Leave the key. Those were the only two things you could hear. And <laughs> from the time I heard that until now, it's still just getting chills. I've never heard any other EVP before. I just tuned into your show tonight, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to share that with you. Well, why were your parents messing around with stuff like that? My mom was on a spiritual journey. She tried everything, PM, uh, S, uh, you know. I do. They dabbled in all these, all these things for quite a while. And well, you know, when you dabble in those things, a lot of times those things dabble back. Yeah, eventually they became Catholics. <laughs> really? So, yeah. Interesting road. Yeah. Uh, interesting road indeed. Uh, from witchcraft and dabbling, as you put it, to Catholicism. <laughs> you know, as unlikely a road as that as that sounds like, I get it. In other words, if you dabble enough and you get into dark areas to the degree that you become a believer in things dark and things, say it, evil, then I would think at some point in your life you would turn from that to what you would think would save you. Does that make sense? certainly does to me. Prove one and you've proven the other, kind of like Richard's white bird. Hello there, uh, Dark Matter, and you have arrived. All right. Yes. This is Mike from... Mike, uh, please turn your radio off. It's off. It's off. Okay, thank you. This is Mike from... Uh, dang it, shut up. From uh, Modesto, California. Mega Roswell Dittos. Thank you. Uh, wanted to uh, ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, I have a cat, and I'm going to sound crazy because I'm not a nut, but... <laughs> This cat sits on numerous occasions looking up at the ceiling and following something. Now, I know. Oh, yes. Oh, no, you're not crazy. 
Uh, I, I've seen it all the time with uh-huh. my cats. They see things that we do not. There's no question about it. What do you think they are, Art? Something that, given the opportunity, would grab your neck and rip it out. Oh, my God, I got the cat here to save me. <laughs> or maybe just a bug going across yeah. the Yeah. Yeah, I look for I look for insects, but there's there's none there. Uh, I got another question for you. I was yes, looking at the yes. Ukraine uh, advertisement, and yes. I noticed you're standing next to a King Air 350. Are you a pilot? And that, is that your airplane? Not even a little bit of a pilot. Oh. My uh, my big experience in the air, sir, was uh, crashing in a hang glider, breaking my oh. arm. Well, mm. so much for piloting. <laughs> Com- compound fracture, actually, up in Alaska. Holy cow. Mm-hmm. Oh, I All right, that, that, well, well, listen, thank that, you. Right, thank you very much, and I'll briefly tell you the story. I was working for KENI Radio up in Anchorage, and the radio station folks convinced me that it would be a cool idea to promote the radio uh, station by having me, their morning show, go off into the wilderness in Alaska, kind of into the wilderness as far as I was concerned anyway, down near Palmer, Alaska, and hang glide. And for that purpose, I had found the owner of a hang gliding company. Right? And he came along for my safety. And... um we were running, we were supposed to run along with this hang glider off a small cliff or hill, I guess would be more like it, and take flight and then land. And that was going to be the, that, that was it. He said, Art, nothing can go wrong. The wind is perfect. No problems. Guarantee you, you'll be fine. So I was in the air. Thank God I had taken flight. The air was under me, the sky above, the ground below. And I think that I was probably airborne for about 10 seconds, maybe 12. And then that which could not happen occurred. As I was uh, lying on the ground with uh, my bones sticking out, the guy said, you know, I'm really sorry. He said, I'm sorry, Art. That wind came out of nowhere. That cross wind came out of nowhere. I looked up at him, and I said, and I was kind of numb. I said, you said it couldn't happen. I don't I don't remember what was said, what was said after that. And uh, on the way to the hospital, everybody donated their drugs to me. And so by the time I got to the hospital to get the arm set, the doctor looked at me and said, he's had enough. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Bravo, Art. How are you tonight? Okay. Kind of enjoying open lines. Oh, it's very, very good. Um, I have a quick question about that audio clip you played in the first hour. Um, it said the name Peter Gersten, and that made my ears perk up. How oh, old yes. is that audio clip? Well, pretty old um, in the sense that, you know, Jesse Marcel was on there, the original Marcel. So pretty old. I, I thought very revealing. I mean, here we have a man who knows aircraft up and down, inside and out. And the man said it was not one of our aircraft. You know, this was absolutely out of this world. And what do you say about that? Well, well, I, I just don't know. But I, I heard Peter Gerson's name, and I actually met him a couple of years ago in Sedona. Sure. Peter Allen Gerson. Is this the same Peter Gerson? Absolutely. Okay, okay. Well, I didn't realize he was involved that much with Roswell. When I met with him, they were, he was really stuck on talking about the uh, some of Michael Talbot's theories about the holographic universe and I didn't even really get to ch- had the chance to visit with him much about some of his research with the Phoenix Lights and with other UFO cases because he was he was really devout in trying to spread the message that this that there's that we're in a big matrix and that matrix is breaking down. So I just wanted some clarification from that. Thank you very hard. And wait, 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 yeah, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Matrix, uh, do you believe that there's any chance, sir, that we are all living? In a matrix that we're all, um, actually science is looking at this right now and getting ready to try and test for it. I mentioned this to, um, uh, yeah, professor heard, we had I heard on. that over the, over the air in the last couple of days and I, you know, I think that the answers are, are definitely out there. I went down to Sedona for a, uh, Indigo children gathering here on 11-11 of 2011 and that's when I got to meet Peter 
And the whole week that I was down there, I got to see a lot of things around all the different um, portals and everything else there that would really indicate that something's breaking down. So um, I, there's more than meets the eye here. We're definitely crossing over to a different dimension. That's that's kind of okay. what I feel that the whole 2012 movement was, was us moving into that new paradigm where we can't see any things like that. So. All right. I really appreciate the call. Thank you. How many of the rest of you think that we are living in some sort of matrix. Yeah, sure, I saw the movie, like everybody else. But science is seriously considering this matter now, that we're in a matrix, that is to say. I've got quite a bit of material on it here, but I don't have to say much more than I've just said. How many of you have wondered whether we're actually living in a matrix? How many of you have seen some sort of evidence that you would cite we actually are in a matrix? In other words, we're all puppets walking around in a pre-planned universe. And that if somebody were to throw the right switch, the pre-planned universe would effectively disappear and we'd be somewhere or somewhere else. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, Hi. Turn your radio off, please. Always first. Everybody do that. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, first-time caller, uh, and I really enjoy your show. I've listened to it off and on for years. Finally, I have finally I have a satellite radio, and I can hear you clearly now instead of the AM stuff. Isn't that nice? Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful. I, I, every chance I get, and I'm up this late, I'm an over-the-road driver, and uh, every time I'm up this late and I get a chance to tune in, I, I do so. Uh, I've always, of- I've always, frankly, thought. I know they have trucker shows and stuff like that, but I've always thought that we had more listeners uh, in trucks than the trucker shows had. I have no doubt about that. Uh, your show is very entertaining. I, uh, it uh, gives food for thought on all sorts of subjects that, uh, you know, you don't consider every day. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, uh, doing this. You know, it's really entertaining, keeps me awake, and, and I really enjoy it. Um, as far as, as what you were talking about earlier, uh, uh, about whether or not I thought there was a matrix or, or something, I right. I I, I don't I don't feel like that. Uh, I have had one experience in my life that that uh, I know to be true. Uh, I used to. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I could entertain the thought of, of being different dimensions or or uh, possibility of, of spirits or demons or, or something like that. Or that, well, let, let's stick with what happened. What what happened to you? Well, what happened to me was when I was a kid, I used to go to bed at night, and I would dream. And at each the next day, everything I dreamed would come true. And, uh, yeah, it was really wild because I was a kid, and it was scary to me. Uh, I wasn't old enough to, to uh, appreciate it, I guess. It, it scared me more than anything. And uh, I did notice, however, that if I – Saw an event. It would just be certain events, and a lot of them were meaningless, you know. Uh, but uh, if I recognized an event about to happen that I had dreamed of the night before, and I did something different yes. than, than what was in my dream, then the entire rest of the day was absolutely new to me, and I didn't know what was going to happen. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I've never heard that before. I've never heard it. So, so you were able to actually. Have a dream every night, and then every. the next day recognize that dream, and you could either go along with it or change something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How and I, cool is that? Well, it, it was scary to me, but uh, I even proved it one time to my parents. I uh, I got up that morning, and, and my father was religious about watching the morning news, uh-huh. and uh, and I got up and and uh, early that morning and uh, was telling them about. Uh, uh, Somebody had died, and and, and uh, they were bringing his uh, coffin off the plane, and it had the American flag on it. And, right, right. Uh, and I don't even remember who it was that died. It was a, a senator or something. And right. uh, uh, they 
they, you know, as they were watching the news, hear it come on, and they started showing them all the events that I just told them about. And they, I remember them looking at each other and and <laughs> and just, in, you know, like, what do we? Probably, think? probably saying something like, "Is that really our seed?" Yeah, <laughs> they're like, I mean, they, they didn't know what they they didn't know what to say to me. You know, they, I I understand. I pretty much yeah. ignored it. You know, I I get it. Um, thank you very much. That is fascinating. Um, any of the rest of you have that? Can you imagine having a dream every single night and having it come true the next day religiously? And or, as he pointed out, this was a real trick part of it, I thought, being able to recognize that you're in the middle of that dream and then changing something that then changed the rest of the day. Now, what does that say about time? I'm going to be thinking about this one for a while. That is really, really cool. A Dark Matter has you on the air. Hello. Oh, that's wonderful. Let me let me check out my gum. I almost swallowed it there. <laughs> like, I'm so excited, my heart's beating like a zebra tap dancing on Jello. Oh, and, it'll get better. Okay. Um, okay. Here's here's one for you. It's not a UFO story, but it's an absolutely true story that okay. happened about tw- 22 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the late 50s, early 60s, I was a youngster back east. And I had a great, great aunt who I spent a lot of time with. We were very close. And then about the mid-60s, when I was about 10, she and my parents had a falling out, and I wasn't allowed to see her anymore. Right. And then about 10 years after that, she died. But I didn't go to the funeral. And then uh, about 22 years ago, I was visiting my hometown, and... I said, I wonder if I went to the cemetery, if I could find my great-great-aunt's grave. Mm-hmm. So I, I had been there as a child, uh, maybe when I was six or seven, and I, I barely remembered how to get to the place. I, ended, I drove, and I ended up on a side street, but it was next to the cemetery. So it was a nice day. I got out of the car, walked along the edge of the property where there was a little stone wall, and then I got to a break in the wall, and there was a pathway that I guess the digging, digging equipment and groundskeepers used that for access. So I said, well, I'll just go in here, because it was a very large cemetery, thousands of graves. Okay. So I walk, walked down this service path for about 20 feet, and then I stop, And I look to my right, and like four or five headstones down that row is my great-great-aunt's grave. Okay. Now, I have no explanation for that. Um, you mean be, so, just being so close to it? The fact that you just went in and boom, there it is? Well, that I walked in, uh, I barely knew how to get to the cemetery. So I per- got there, walked down that little path, Perhaps and then you stopped. Were guided. Yeah, maybe you were guided. Well, and see, that's uh, not the only experience uh, of a psychic, I guess, nature that I've had. Um in the mid-80s, I studied with a psychic, and then the very first day of class, there were about a dozen people in the class, none of whom I met, I had ever known before. Uh, and the first exercise that we did was to hold an object owned by somebody else. Okay, mm-hmm. I, I held this woman's ring, I guess it was, or a bracelet, and picked up vibes or impressions of her home. I About half it. a dozen things. Yeah, I, I, I believe it, and probably uh, more than that, uh, things about her life and the rest of uh, the rest of what might come along with something like that. You can do that. You might try it. Pick up an object um, that belongs to somebody else and just uh, have some quiet time. You know, in this day and age, we don't have much quiet time. As I mentioned earlier, we have the Internet. We have Facebook. We have a million different things to occupy our minds, and we have very little downtime, very little quiet time. But if you want to try an experiment, you want to have some fun, (laughs) if this kind of thing for you is fun, then give it a shot. An object of somebody else, uh, that belongs to somebody else, don't be seen marching away with it, but uh, if you can do it reasonably, hold on to something and see what you get. It requires, as I mentioned, quiet time. Dark matter, you're on the air. Hi. Mega Roswell, Art Bell. Thank you. Uh, this is Mike Hall from Central California. I had a quick question. Uh, if you're going to do any truth or trash episodes in the future. I might. Sure, why not? 
All right, I sure miss those. Anyways, I'll keep it short. That was it. Uh, great to hear you back on. Seven. Seven. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I had some other stuff, but I totally forgot. <laughs> seven three. Totally oh, blew it out of your mind. Seven three. That's M Radio. Truth or trash? That's kind of fun, and uh, it's very simple. You simply uh, get somebody who's got a story. You know, it, it wouldn't be as easy for me. Because I'm not, uh, I would have to actually screen the calls to some degree myself to get somebody who's got a really outrageous story and let them tell it and then kind of have a panel of three or four people to judge whether it's truth or trash and then have the person come back and, you know, tell the panel if they're right or wrong. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you're on Dark Matter. Hello. Hello. No, I guess you're not. Let's try this one. Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art Ross. Well, to you, my friend. Thank you. Um, two things I have to tell you, and one is a complaint. Uh, the first thing is, uh, as a young keeper, I was throwing snowballs at cars, and in the middle of the night, we saw a big, huge, orange fireball going across the sky. Wait a minute. When, it. When, when you were a kid throwing snowballs at cars, I think yes, I've sir. seen you, uh, you saw a big orange fireball in the sky? Yeah, in northeast Pennsylvania. And couldn't explain it. I looked it up on the Internet, couldn't find nothing. Maybe but, it was a dri- maybe it was a driver shooting back. It could have been. It could have been. <laughs> but the, the second incident that we saw in that matter was um, right after 9/11. It was the week, more or less the week going into the you know, week after. We were driving up Newburgh, New York. We're 18 wheeler drivers, and we we're doing dropping hooks, turn around, coming back. Well, you know that Newburgh Airport's up there, and they have the Army base or whatever. Um, we saw three lights in the sky, right against. SK-84 with a dome light, you know, like a, or a reddish dome light in the middle. The guy with me, he's a hard Jehovah witness. And uh, we both looked at it. We pulled over off the road, down the road, because we were a little nervous. This thing did not go up and down left or right. It, like, it, it went straight. It didn't, no hover or nothing. I mean, we were underneath it, didn't see nothing. But a little bit ago, my cousin was going down the other direction, because we all had to come down in the PA. He saw the same identical thing, but we had to get out from the cell phone, you know, the towers are bad between the mountains, cut the other side in the Pennsylvania, he calls me and says, you won't believe what I saw, and he got me hooked on you. I, I give him the reason why I'm in loving that you're back. Well, we, right. he, saw a, he saw the identical thing down in uh, Pennsylvania off Interstate 780. All right, listen, I've got to take a break, so I've got to go, but I appreciate the call. Right here, my friend. Take care. And do take care. This is Dark Matter. I'm Mark Bell. Some velvet morning when I was This is really cool. Somebody has wormholed me. That doesn't sound right, does it? Somebody has sent me a message through the wormhole which says... Is it because of the entanglement theory that holding objects can tell you things? What a really cool thought. Is it because of entanglement? Now remember, what do we know about entanglement? We know it's quantum theory. We know that if two objects are made familiar to each other, particles, electrons, which flip and flop, They can then be separated. First, they have to be together. But then they can be separated, well, by as much distance as you would care to put between them. And they will flip and flop in unison, point forward, and forevermore. So this person is saying, is it because of that entanglement theory, if you project it, that holding objects can tell you things? Is that fascinating or what? Dark Matter, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Hi. Art, it's you. Yes. Oh, yes. my heavens. I have been waiting to talk to you for probably ten years about this story. All right. Turn your radio off and let's... I did, yeah. sir. I did, okay. sir. Right. Um, I live in Santa Cruz. Okay. And I was visiting a friend of mine in, in, in Monterey Bay um, down in Capitola, which is near the power plant. I know and, where it is. Yeah. And, and it's a beautiful area. And this was one of these really nice homes, and we had dinner. And then I started, I was having a cigarette because I smoked. And I was walking along the pool, and I was looking out over the bay. 
and all of a sudden I saw this green light come up from under the water. Mm. And okay. this object came up. It was glowing green, and mm. it had kelp draped all over it, which which was very remarkable because you know, normally you don't hear people mentioning little details like that. And it no, I'd be so gone. I, I would be panicked, and my my heart would probably jump out of my chest. I well, mean, a glowing green object with kelp on it surfaces. What was it? I don't know. It it kept surfacing, and then it kept going up into the air, and then it mm. started to move towards the moss landing plant. And at that point, I the two other people I was having dinner with, we – they happened to have one of those telescopes, those little spy glasses. I used to live, by the way, in Moss Landing, so you know. Oh, oh, cool. I used so, to, I used to eat, eat strawberries in the strawberry field under the high tension lines coming up out, out of the plant. Oh, half million amazing. volt. Fantastic strawberries there, but yeah. we had a spy glass, and so we started looking at it through the spy glass. Yes. It raised up. It it went across the bay over to Moss Landing, because we were in Capitola at that point, so, you know, right. there's a few miles between those. And it hovered in front of the Moss Landing plant for about 30 minutes, and we were looking at it through the spyglass, all three of us. I called the cops. They said, you're seeing a fishing boat. I'm like, fishing boats don't float no. in the air, and they're not no. green. <laughs> covered. No, they're not. And when we looked at it through the spyglass, we actually saw that the green light was actually a combination of elliptoid lights that were green, amber, and green. Mm -hmm. And then the weirdest thing that two of us saw, my husband didn't see it, but, but the other person we were with saw it, was it looked like there was some kind of a mechanical arm that came across that was going out of, the, of whatever it was, a craft I'm assuming, and taking something from the power plant. Then, for 30 minutes, it sat there doing this, and we finally had to leave because we had to get home, because we live in Santa Cruz, and I kept watching it out the back seat of the car, or out the back window, yeah. and it winked out and disappeared. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's what I would have done. I, I'd have winked out. I'm sorry. We're so, so out of time. It has been a pleasure. Very interesting Jeremy Meter story early on. Uh, make of that what you will and fascinating open lines. It's been my pleasure and we'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great night, everybody. From the high desert, the great American Southwest, Dark Matter says good night.